How are you doing here? Where's the gang? <laughs> yeah, it's 726. Where is the gang? Yeah. Well, there's no rush. <laughs> well, four whole minutes. All seven said they were coming, so. Hey, um, Kareem, hmm? is Cecil here or? Um... Uh, I'm not sure. He's got his, his thing is, is um, muted right now and they might be finishing up Sark. It's Sark at seven. So for oh, some okay. reason, um, Seligman's not allowed to go on again. Oh. Let's see. There's Daniel. <laughs> Hello. Imagine if, if uh, Cecil's still doing the other meeting that he might, uh, there, the other people might be waiting in the waiting room to come in. Hmm. Uh. Ah, here's Chief Bird. Yeah. Hey, Good Chief. Interesting. Ah, there we go. Hi, Andrew. You're muted. I am on mute. Hi, everyone. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> A quick uh, reminder, what is the distance um, one must be from a item to have to recuse? Uh, is it 500 feet? 500 feet. 500. Uh, chairperson, Ray? Yes, it is. I'm exactly 500 feet from item number one, the 85 Gilman Street. So I, I believe I should recuse myself from item number one when we get to that point. Okay. Exactly 500. According to Google Maps, <laughs> exactly 500. Wow. Did wow. you measure that from your, <laughs> from your unit or the property? Um, I can double check. I measured it from my door, but I mean, let me zoom in and get a little more detail. You, you may be closer. That's because um, there's common areas that you have an interest in. So I would measure from the curb of the yeah. property to this property. So you're probably even closer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, looking at the parking lot um, where the, the cars are parked at 85 Gilman, um, which yeah. is on the south 
edge to my doorstep. That's by the crow flies. Um, oops, hold on. I did something wrong here. Let me adjust this. Well, actually, this shows that I'm uh, a little over 600 feet when I, I tidy it up. So I guess I'm, I'm just outside of the, the range of it. Once again, did you, me did you measure from the complex property line, not your oh. door? Oh, from my complex, from the uh, neighborhood? Yep, I can do that. You're right. Yeah. Um, that shows as 471 feet. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm within the 500 foot um, realm. Okay, well you're out for that okay. item. I'll um, I'll mute in my screen and um, audio. Is that acceptable? I I don't not even sure. We might have to ask the city attorney. Because you know when we have it when we have the live meetings, you have to leave the room. So. I mean, you could watch it separately on YouTube and disconnect now. Oh, yeah. Because on the agenda, there is a link to the YouTube, the city's YouTube channel. Yep, I will do that. I have the link open, and I'll um, I'll, um, I'll join, or I guess I'll stay on until the first item's open. I want to make sure that once you log off, that you can get back in. That's the other thing too. Mm. That might be a Cecil question. I dreadfully sorry I'm late. I joined the wrong. Uh, I joined oh, the wrong fine. webinar. Hopefully, I'm. We haven't taken attendance yet. No, no, we're still we're still waiting. Still still assembling. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. Bear with me one second, uh, folks. I'm just getting one other person in. So bear with me one second. Bear with me one second, uh, folks. I'm just getting one other person in. So bear with me one second. Can we confirm my audio is working, Commissioner Colville? Yes, that works, Commissioner Colville. Hey, Thank Ryan, you. Are you are you there, Ryan? Yes, I'm here. Um, our city attorney is having a difficult time getting on. Can, is it possible to get a hold of Bill? Yeah, I could. Uh, I'll send him an email right now to send him the link. Just uh, uh, one can thing. See, uh, one thing I realized that I had multiple invites, and so I was using the wrong invite. Same here. Yeah, it was the July. I had done the same thing. Yeah. 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 I was waiting for July 13th. That was going to be. <laughs> okay, Bill. I uh, promoted you to. Are you here? Perfect. All right. Well, well we got most people here. I guess we could start. We don't have uh, yet. Commissioner Ostrowski was going to come in. Should we wait for her, uh, Kareem? Um, well, I defer to, to Bill, I mean, to, to Paul. Uh, Maggie was on the stock meeting a few minutes. You can minutes. see us. Oh, there he is. There he is. So I was under the impression that we needed all seven people here tonight. Try them. At least one Try them too. Well, that's for the. Uh, I guess we, we could start now. I suppose, huh? Is is Maggie here? Is not on, not yet. On. Was she at Sark? Um, yes, yeah. she was. Yeah. Oh, oh, she was. Oh, good. Yeah, I did the same as everybody else. I I joined the July one. 
Well, I'll be <laughs> repeating she's... item number one. So if you need it on a number of people, you have it if Maggie's not attending first item. Yeah. She'll be okay. Well, Mr. Chair, it's up to you. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll get started. We'll assume that Commissioner Ostrowski will get here in plenty of time for our uh, probably both of our items. But uh, so let's uh, call the meeting of June 23rd, 2020 City of Campbell Planning Commission meeting to order. And the this Planning Commission meeting is conducted via telecommunications and is in compliant with provisions of the Brown Act and Executive Order N-29-20 issued by the governor. Uh, Karine, can we have a, uh, a roll call? Commissioner's bookbinder. Present. King. Here. Colville. Present. Lines. Here. Rivlin. Here. And Chair Cray. Here. I believe that uh, Vice Chair will show up shortly. She's not here yet. Okay. So has uh, has everyone had uh, had a chance to review the minutes of our last meeting? That was June 9th. Uh, I had some notes on the meeting on the minutes. Uh, one of the votes was incorrectly recorded. I had sent a right. note to Corinne about that, but it, uh, when I checked the minutes before coming here, they had not been updated about that. It will be updated. See, but yeah, I think you should still note the correction, uh, Commissioner Bookbinder, just so we have it. Uh, certainly, I have it written down here. Just a moment. Yeah, I know. I know. <clears throat> I think ah, um, in the roll call vote at about one hour, 20 minutes in on the YouTube recording, Commissioners Hines and Cray voted against um, uh, agendizing the discussion of the commercial parking modifications. Uh, it was four to two, not unanimous. Yeah. And with that correction, is there uh, a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move to approve the minutes as amended. I second, second that. The first. And, uh, roll call vote. Voice vote. One moment. All Aye. in favor? Aye. <laughs> Aye. 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 Any abstentions? No. I need to know who made the motion and who said uh, it. Uh, Thank you, sir. I made the motion. And Colville, you seconded it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Direct, Director Kermoyan, do we have any communications for the commission? Um, I'm, I'm just reading the email here from Maggie. She's still trying to get on. Um, the, all the communications that were sent, uh, we we either have desk items that we forwarded to you um, via email and um, there's nothing else to report. No agenda modifications or postponements? There, there are no agenda modifications. Okay, so at this part of the meeting is where we're, uh, we, uh, open uh, for oral requests to speak on any item that's not on the agenda. You may speak up to uh, to three minutes, and uh, that of course can be no action on anything that's not on the agenda. But we're happy to have any input, and I I think we were supposed to get some input. So does anybody uh, want to speak uh, address something that's not on the agenda? Yeah, I have uh, ten attendees here, so I'm gonna do them one by one. Audrey, you go ahead. Yeah, hi, I'm Audrey Keytriver, President of Staff. So uh, I note that there's been a number of uh, projects before the council that had a request for fence exceptions. And we're kind of starting to add a note about that to pretty much everything we write nowadays. Um, these are the six foot fence um, should be over. Uh, homes are much taller, bigger. Even single story homes are often built with nine or 10 foot walls nowadays to increase the height a bit to, to accommodate um, those who prefer to have some 
a space feeling in their home. And we just think that it's, it's burdensome to uh, not allow an eight foot fence right from the start. So I, I don't know whether this has to be initiated by the council, the planning commission or who, but I would just like the consideration um, of this change to the general code um, be something that at some point gets agendized and, uh, and addressed. And uh, right now I think it's just being handled through a, a whole lot of exceptions. So uh, thank you, that was it. Uh, thank you, Audrey. Uh, thank Director, you. Director Kamoyan, is there any uh, any reaction to that or anything we can do on that request? No, there's, there is no reaction. It's just it's an oral comment that was provided. And it's not on the agenda, so we really can't discuss it. Okay. Any other? Uh... But um, just to be clear, we could, if we wanted to discuss this, we would at the end of the meeting uh, decide to agendize it and discuss it later. That's how we would proceed if we wanted to, correct? That's correct. Mr. Wong, I think we lost you. You were going Uh, yes, uh, this is Gordon Wong. Yes, sir. Yeah, please, uh, you can address the commission. Um, uh, could you repeat the question for me? No, I thought you wanted to address the uh, commission. I, I will briefly add Gordon Wong is actually the applicant for the first item on the agenda, so he might oh, okay. just be a little bit out of order. Oh, yeah. yeah, we'll wait. We'll wait for you. Hang uh, on. Just a anybody note, else uh, want to? Anybody yeah, else want to address the commission on an item not on the agenda? Chair Cray, there's a, a comment in the Q and A. Yeah. There's a comment in the where now? Yeah, in the Q and A, uh, Raj uh, Palala is asking how to join the meeting to ask questions and make a public comment. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to tell him. <laughs> I got Raj here now. Go ahead, Roger. Oh, there you go. Hey, uh, so I wanted to join about the ADU, which is the item two. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes, but we'll, we can hear you. you can speak on that item when it comes up. Uh, yeah, so. uh, there, I just wanted to know, I was going through the email, online instructions, it doesn't mention anywhere, like, how can I talk? But looks like one of you can unmute me and we can, I can talk about it, right? Oh yeah, and when that item comes up, we'll ask for comments, sure. Okay. Anybody else want to address anything that's not on the agenda, not on the planning commission agenda? It doesn't look like uh, we thought there might be some folks uh, that wanted to address something, but I, I don't hear or see anybody. So there were a few emails that came through for public comment. How are we handling those in light of the remote meeting? I'm actually allowing, allowing, uh, Pardon me, the, the emails that came in appear to be for an item that we voted on previously. Right, but I thought those, I thought those emails were um, comments that were submitted for the um, public comments um, that, that the public can, um, where they can express themselves on any topic at the beginning of the planning commission meeting. Well, that's correct. Commissioner, however, we have an opportunity for them to be present and to, to restate their, their comments. So um, we prevented their ability to be here. Um, we supported it. We forwarded those to the commission because that's what we always do when we receive emails. We'll forward the comments to you. So you're, you're aware. Great. Hi, uh, are you guys able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if this is the correct time to bring up the, the comment or the email that I had submitted. Sorry, it took so long. I think I had been uh, muted. So you guys weren't able to, to hear me and I, I don't have the ability to unmute myself. Um, I, yes, sorry. Uh, my name's Shannon Ross. Um, I had noticed in the last meeting that there was a request through measure O uh, to fund a um, militarized armored vehicle. Um, and I just wanted to understand um, 
had you guys decided to pay for that item out of Measure O? Um, and if not, uh, when that decision was going to be made? Um, I, I would like to push for it not to be paid out of Measure O because I think all of the documentation that I've read of Measure O is for building renovation, seismic changes and stuff like that. So I, I feel like it's a, a little bit out of um, the intent of what Measure O was for. Well, Shannon, I don't have an exact answer for you. I do know that the city council has the, their budget meeting uh, on Thursday. Uh, when action will be taken, we we had a vote the last at our last meeting, June 9th, So we can't we're not acting on this today. But uh, does anybody have an answer for for Shannon on her question? Um, I can actually. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's not being sure. measure all. Okay. okay. It it's I can confirm that the uh, armored rescue vehicle is not at all a part of measure O. It, okay. I agree. It does it doesn't fit into the language of measure O. It was uh, simply part of the uh, CIP requests. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, that, that was my question, thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Anybody else wish to, to speak on any item that's not on the agenda today? Mr. Thank Chair, there, there, there's someone named Raja Palala. Would well, like he wants to speak on item two. He added another comment that he wants to make a public comment on what is not on the agenda. So I don't oh. know if you want to. Uh, he added a, just a second comment that he made. I have uh, Mike Wallace that raised his hand. So uh, go ahead, Mike. If you have some questions. Yes, I have a question. Is this the correct time to talk about the militarized armored car the police department is requesting and to give my opinion as to whether or not it should be approved? Well, at this time, we're, we're taking any comments on items that aren't on the Planning Commission agenda for today. There's two items on the agenda, so you're welcome to speak on that item. Uh, we, we did vote on it at our last meeting, June 9th. We have no action on that today, and the City Council does is taking up their budget issues in, uh, in a meeting on Thursday. So you're welcome to comment, uh, Mr. Wallace, or, or you know. Sure, the yes. Well, I, I guess I would like to, to uh, direct this to uh, Chief Berg, uh, if you don't mind. So with all of the problems um, and anger towards we see nationwide about the police militarizing things and, and heavy handed, what we see on TV, heavy handed uh, public uh, problems that, that's occurring because of that, why, does the chief think we need a quarter million dollar armored car to militarize things even more here in Campbell? Now, my understanding is it's mostly from the Denny standoff, but that really wasn't a, a standoff where people were in danger and being held hostage, correct, chief? Um, uh, there was nobody inside Denny's, but I'll... I'll uh... I think there's some disagreement on whether or not anybody was in danger, but go ahead. Well, my question is, why does the, why do you think that we need a $250,000 armored car for Campbell? Because of that one instance only, that doesn't seem like enough of a reason. Could you explain that please? Mr. Chair, if, if I could just interrupt here the, the the speaker mr walls has the opportunity to state his beliefs and concerns we're not in a position to have a conversation uh this is not on the agenda uh, i'm sure chief berg would be more than happy to have a private conversation with mr wallace and on june 25th the city council will be deciding on the budget mr wallace is welcome to come to that meeting as well but we can't have a conversation on something not on the agenda. So, okay, Mr. Wallace, if that's uh, that's good, then uh, does anybody else want to speak on an item that's not on the agenda? Okay, seeing or hearing nobody else, uh, let's move to our regular meeting agenda. Item one is a uh, public hearing to consider the application of Gordon Wong for an app. Hey, Mr. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. This gentleman, Raja, wants to talk, and I'm, I'm oh. trying to. I, oh, there's my Q&A. 
Can I talk okay. now? Can I talk now? I just yes, got the notification. Go yes, yes, please. Yeah, three, three minutes, please. Yeah, so uh, regarding the ADUs, uh, the state has given amnesty and pretty much a lot of cities are giving amnesty. I saw that last week there was an agenda item uh, about giving a five-year amnesty on existing ADUs in the city of Campbell. I would like to thank the staff to bringing that to the attention of commission. It's very disappointing that it has not passed because these are structures that were built 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, I'm surprised that the commissioners are not considerate about things that were built like a long time ago when city doesn't even have proper record keeping system. Um, so, and I saw that there were only six commissioners at the time during the meeting. So is it possible to bring this item again onto the agenda, maybe today or in the future and vote when there is a full uh, uh, presence of the public commissioners. I saw that it was a three and three uh, vote. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it will pass when, if, with uh, everyone present there. So that, that's the comment I want to make and make the request to bring it back onto the agenda if possible. Okay, well, thank, thank you for your comment. And uh, no more public comments, then we'll close that part of the meeting and we'll move to item number one. Chair, Clay, I'm gonna, I'll recuse myself from item one and I'll uh, stand by and rejoin for item number two. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Rivlin. So item number one, public hearing to consider the application of Gordon Wong for an administrative plan development permit, PLN 2019-234, to allow for the establishment of a small fitness studio and a parking modification permit to allow for a reduction in the number of required parking spaces at 85 Gilman Avenue in the PD Plan Development Zoning District. And our planner is Stephen Rose. Thank you and good evening. Give me one second to share my screen here. Cecil, would it be possible, or actually Ryan, could you raise my permissions a bit to share the screen? Go ahead. Thank you. Is everyone seeing the presentation? Yep. I do. Yep. Great. So as just captured, the first item on tonight's agenda is to consider a request to allow the establishment of a small fitness studio at 85 Gilman Avenue. The project site is located on the west side of Gilman Avenue, south of East Campbell Avenue, as shown highlighted at the center of the screen in yellow. The property is developed with a parking lot at the front and an L-shaped uh, industrial building towards the back. The applicant is requesting approval of an administrative plan development permit to allow for the establishment of a 3,900 square foot fitness studio and a parking modification permit to allow for reduction in the number of required parking spaces. The business intends to operate a CrossFit fit business model where a maximum of nine occupants, including staff, would be inside the facility at any given time. Uh, and they'd be effectively rotating between equipment stations. While the business would also allow one-on-one -on -one training, the, such operation would be coordinated with the group sessions not exceed the nine, uh, ma uh, nine occupant maximum, which is intended to line up with the number of available parking spaces on the property, which is nine. In forming its recommendation for denial, uh, staff recommended several, uh, reviewed several key areas of concern, including the request for a parking modification permit, adequacy of the site to support the use, removal of on-site landscaping, and a number of policies which would encourage lot consolidation and redevelopment of the property for housing. So in regard to parking, uh, the, the existing property was developed in 1979 with intent of serving heavy industrial warehouse uses with limited on-site staff. As a result, the building is parked at a ratio of one space per 460 square feet of floor area, which is less than what the city would have for even a warehouse building today. While the applicant has attempted to match the number of op occupants with the number of on available on-site parking spaces, there appears to be a fundamental mismatch between the size of the building and the type of use. Comparing the applicant's proposal uh, to other recently approved small fitness facilities, you see a table in the bottom left-hand uh, corner of the presentation. Um, this particular proposal has nearly twice the uh, floor area relative to the number of occupants of other recently approved facilities in one instance, that being 471 East Campbell Avenue, it has four times as much floor area given the number of occupants. 
So while the applicant has emphasized the proximity of the site to light rail, and this is kind of relying on that graphic in the bottom right here, that's a aerial map. Uh, the light rail is shown in blue and uh, bus, bus stops are shown in pink, as well as operational characteristics of the use as reasons to reduce the amount of required on-site parking. In practice, what we've found as staff is that despite the best intentions of operators, uh, what happens is that these higher intensity uses will eventually expand uh, to fill the space and in order to stay competitive and profitable, uh, which eventually just results in uh, additional complaints and something that the city would need to uh, utilize resources to remedy through code enforcement and the like. Uh, in order to transition this older uh, industrial building to accommodate the proposed fitness facility, the applicants proposed a complete interior remodeled space, removal of the interior second floor. Uh, they would need a demo and exterior trash enclosure, a shed, and almost uh, all on-site uh, landscaping. So uh, the little exhibit here on the right, can you guys actually see the mouse on the screen? That would actually be helpful if anybody. Can you? Yeah. That's actually yeah. super yeah. useful. Okay. Small, this, yeah. Yes, you can see it. Okay, so this area over here, this is where the landscaping occurred on uh, occurs on the property. There isn't very much. There's a couple small patches towards the front as well. So the building code would require the site to provide an accessible path of travel along the south property line and extending in front of and spanning the, uh, the driveway apron here. There's a lot of improvements you need to do the property. And really what we're doing here is we're, re we're removing what little landscaping is left on the property, which is, could be seen as inconsistent with the intent of the PD ordinance, which is really quite to the contrary. It's to provide a, an abundance of open space to really facilitate um, um, an optimum quality and, and, and condition of the property. Uh, the last point I really wanted to make was, um, and as discussed in the report, the project site is identified as a housing opportunity site in the general plan. It ha also has a mixed use land use designation of medium high density residential commercial. And it's also located within sub area three, the South of Campbell Avenue area plan. Taken together, these documents and a number of policies in our general plan would encourage lot consolidation and to see this site improve with housing. Recognizing the city is falling short of its obligations to produce housing units and the proposed improvements may conflict with that objective by extending the life of a non-conforming industrial building, the planning commission may want to consider if this would be the highest and best use of the property. So on the screen um, over here on the bottom left, uh, we're actually looking at uh, the subject site, which is um, indicated, actually it's a little bit, that error is a little bit off. It's the site right here. This particular owner happens on these three parcels here. Uh, 63 Gilman up is up for sale here. So reasonably, if we just if this an additional property would be acquired, or in combination with some of the other properties which are available in the area, it could be redeveloped. One example of how that could go, just continuing the development pattern of the area on Gilman would just show you could extend out townhouse units or similar to the north. And again, you are close to pro uh, you're in, are in proximity to light rail here, and it is what the uh, the general plan and area plans call for. So it's just something to, to consider as well. With that said, and in consideration of the applica applicant's request, uh, staff is recommending the Planning Commission adopt a resolution denying the request. Alternatives to this action have been included towards the end of the report should the commission find support in the item. This concludes staff's uh, presentation. I'll mention uh, earlier we had, we we're joined by Gordon Wong, who's our applicant. I imagine he'd like to speak as well. Uh, thank, thank you, Stephen. For first, we'll ask if there's any questions for uh, for Stephen Ross. Anybody? Uh, no quick question. Um, yeah, Mr. Bookbinder. So, would it be possible to? You said that the applicant has limited, has assured us that there will be nine occupants in the fitness studio. Nine parking spaces shouldn't be a problem. Uh, but the concern is that the use is the use tends to expand. Uh, would it be possible to just explicitly limit the number of occupants? Yes, you could actually Im impose a condition of approval saying nine. But what we're kind of observing here, staff, is it's kind of a scenario where imagine you had a large uh -huh. warehouse building, and it w you want to operate a restaurant in it, and you were to propose, oh, we're only going to have two seats inside this gigantic warehouse space, and don't worry we won't add additional seats to accommodate additional diners. What we're saying is in our experience as staff, what we find is, although you can add whatever condition that you'd like as part of an entitlement, what we actually see what happens is 
when you have a very large space, something that's in some cases that we're looking at that table, table earlier in the report, four times as large relative to the number of occupants of other fitness facilities, there happens to be a tendency for uh, misuse or abuse. So what we're trying to do is by design, trying to prevent that, trying to pair good, good land uses with um, the right size and, and, uh, and, and sites that have adequate parking. So that's, that's really the observation here. But yes, to your point, a single condition of approval could be added saying, business shall not exceed nine. If there's a code enforcement complaint, we would have to enforce that condition. Thank you. And uh, secondly, you brought up a question about whether or not this is the best use of, um, <clears throat> of the space. Um, are there, have there been proposals to build more townhouses in the properties you pointed out? Not recently, but I could say that uh, in the recent past, we have seen development occur in the area, including the Ropes and Homes Project to the south, as well as St. Anton Communities, which built townhomes. This site only recently became available. It was previously occupied by Etched Media. So I, I don't think it's been on the market for sale or for redevelopment. Uh, it's only been, I think, I, I think the owner or applicant might be to correct me, but I think only less than a year that's been vacant at all. They've been just going through this particular permit process. And I don't believe that they've considered other options. Thank you. But there's a, let me ask a question. Um, is there anything that would prevent the property from being sold down the road? I, I, I you know, kind of feel that I don't think that there would be, but is there, is, should they decide to change and move forward with a housing plan? Is there anything that would um, fall, uh, you know, get in the way of it with this decision? Nothing in the city's control per se. What you do happen to have is when uh, a new tenant occupies a space or oftentimes will be a lease agreement. There are lease terms, years and conditions which are applied on those lease agreements. The second thing, as we identified in the report, is that whenever you see improvement of a property, somebody's reinvesting in that land. In this particular case, the city would be requiring them to accept, install accessible paths of travel, that new driveway uh, ramp, accessible ramp um, or driveway apron. And they're doing a number of other improvements. They're pretty much gutting the entire interior of the tenant space, adding new ADA bathrooms, all kinds of other improvements, which would really effectively extend the useful life of the building. So those are really, they're not impediments to selling the building per se, but that level of reinvestment in a space could preclude, could delay or postpone uh, redevelopment of the lot. This is a consideration or it could raise the, the purchase price of the property as well. Thank you. I'm the property owner, if I can at some hey, moment speak. One, one second, yeah, Mr. Wall, we'll get to you one second. Uh, Stephen, let me just ask you a quick question really quick following up on those questions already asked because that's what I'm kind of wrestling with. So, so we got a site and it's a housing opportunity site. So the city, let's say the city would like to have, you know, low income or below market or market rate housing on that site. A private property owner owns it and it's not housing. I mean, how, how much is this encouragement versus uh, requirement versus, I mean, what, what kind of a, of a power does the city have to ask a, a, a property owner to change the type of use on that site. Yeah, so I, I will broadly say the city can't compel an owner unless through eminent domain or something like that to actually redevelop a site for a particular land use. This site has a viable use. I mean, it was last occupied by etched media. It could continue to operate in a similar fashion as it was last legally permitted. What we have here is a request. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a use, it's a administrative plan development permit which is asking for a change of use of the property. In addition to that, they're asking for a parking modification. So the Planning Commission doesn't have to grant those additional types of permits and requests. Uh, and in so doing, they kind of, you know, in a, in a way they would deter uses other than a, a preferred use of the property. But you don't have to grant a, you know, a bar here either, for that instance, right? You don't have to grant certain uses which you would see as less preferable. So- Let me jump in here, Stephen, just really, really quick. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Planning Commission. So we didn't want to confuse you with this. What we wanted to do was inform you that there's a broader vision out there. There's a vision of seeing this area be altered and modified and to realize this vision. We just wanted to let you know that you have that ability to fulfill that vision. But 
the area plan doesn't do, as Stephen correctly pointed out, it doesn't compel someone to do it. And that's one of the problems with the area plan. It, it really doesn't have uh, a um, initiation aspect to it. So we just wanted to let you know, we have an area plan, there's a broader vision. What the applicant is proposing is within the confines of the zoning ordinance. Uh, we just wanted to let you know that that exists. Should you feel that really this, this area should be redeveloped to realize that vision, you have every right to do that. Um, you know, what is being proposed is in line with the zoning ordinance. Mr. Colville? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Great. I, I, when I look at tenants, property owners, um, of course, I see a business as well, too. Uh, the demand, although our vision might be there for something, and this can be a very general statement, if the demand is not there for the housing units that we have the vision for, then that does us no good because we cannot fulfill that vision without a developer coming in, buying these properties and developing it. And uh, this is something we see very common uh, across the board through the entire Bay Area. Uh, pockets of area that would be fantastic for something great. Uh, but until we get the demand, uh, I find it um, from, a, from a property owner point of view and a business person as well, uh, I feel like it would be uh, almost an extra layer of added regulation that would do uh, me harm as a business owner if I were prevented uh, from doing something with my property that would make it uh, more usable, feasible, economically viable for myself as a business owner and for the tenant, uh, just because the city would like to see somebody else come in uh, and purchase this property and develop it. What we do see very commonly, especially in areas like Sunnyvale and other cities, uh, nothing will stop uh, a company from buying property and developing it uh, if they see the value there. Uh, I would be hard pressed to find a situation where we'd see a major property developer who wanted to do a large scale project uh, be uh, turned off by uh, maybe uh, new construction uh, by remodeling the way we have uh, we see here. My views on it, uh, and this is just a statement, not a question, is that I don't want us to handcuff the uh, property owner uh, and the potential tenant that could have a more viable short-term future, uh, regardless of the vision that we have. Uh, thank you for listening on that. Okay. Yeah, but the, uh, thank you for that, the Commissioner Colville. So these are any any more anybody else have a question for Stephen? And if not, then we'll we'll open up the public hearing. And I know the applicant is uh, waiting to talk. So, Mr. Wong, if you could please keep it to about five minutes, please. And we're happy to hear hear from you now. Question. Um, this is Mr. Wong. Um, from my take on what I see on the project is, let's say, a, you know, we work with a lot of developers here. We got a couple of housing developments in Campbell as well in our office. Um, it does take time to put the, a good project together and a site this complex, it would take actually quite a few years to do a good job. Um, but during those few years, um, is there any flexibility to put a, a, a tenant into this building at a cost that is reasonable for the three year span, three or four years? Um, from our take on it, when we saw this um, business owner with her um, private training, it would be more of a to us, a minimal TI. Um, the hardest hits were landscape and the um, site improvements for the ADA, but that's just how business is out there. Um, our, the our Mr. Were, Wong, mm -hmm. Mr. Wong, uh, just if you could, uh, TI, if you could clarify TI, sorry. Tenant, tenant improvement on the interior of the building. So okay, nothing done to the exterior of the building. It's all within side. We're trying to reuse all the existing electrical and what we can. Um, Thank you. So it was that was what our thought was on this project was, can we in fact make this a usable space during that time span before larger development is possible? Thank you. Thank you. May I, may I speak on the property owner? Yes, sir. Good evening and thank you for your time. I also want to say I want to appreciate I appreciate Stephen's support throughout this process, even though at least as of now, the outcome is not what I wanted. Uh, I own all three properties. I own Etched Media. Uh, we had to move Etched Media for kind of consolidation reasons and, and the company has moved. Um, my personal long-term vision is to develop this into residential, but it's just not the right timing um, for me personally. Um, 
And so uh, the objective was to find high quality tenants that are uh, commensurate with the town we're in, which is Campbell, and, and the fact that you can walk to downtown. Um, and again, my goal is to invest enough to attract the right kinds of tenants, but not to the point where it pushes uh, the opportunity to develop out 10, 15 years. You know, obviously there's a spectrum of investment that you can make. Uh, in this case, when all is said and done, because we actually spent a solid two to three months, um, maybe longer on this, including losing a potential tenant in another one of the properties because of the complexity of the conversations. Um, in this case, it came down to, from my understandings, almost strictly to the parking lot, the parking issue that, you know, uh, the space, the size of the building dictates uh, per formula. Uh, I think what Steven said, I, I can't remember, maybe 15 or 16 spots, obviously, the nature of this building, when it was built and how it was built, there are only nine spots when you account for ADA. Um, but it is a private training facility. The lady that owns the business individually trains um, and holds classes for one or two people at a time. It is highly credible that she doesn't have any more than eight or nine people there uh, at any point in time. She can manage her schedules. Um, all of her um, uh, customers are loyal and dedicated to her training facility. So if she needs to move things around over an eight hour period to make sure that there are no more than eight or nine pe people there, um, it's highly credible and doable. Is it subject to some abuse? Of course, you know, but I don't know. And I, you know, in the end you have to trust um, that somebody can do and will do the, the job that they said they will do. Um, we're investing in this to upgrade it, to make it better, but again, within reason. Um, you know, I still have the vision of, of uh, you know, trying to redevelop those three properties together myself in the future. Uh, and then as you can imagine, I think Commissioner Colville, Colville already said that it is incredibly hard to get five or six owners to sell to one developer. And that, you know, I've seen it because, because I've been approached in the last four years and a couple of times I was willing a seller, but the other land or the other owners close to me were not willing sellers and things fell apart. And now I'm actually facing the reality of not being able to lease out my buildings uh, because of the tight constraints. Can I get the name of the speaker for the minutes, please? Yeah, this is uh, Eli, e -L -I -E, Antun, A-N-T-O-U-N. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else wish to speak on this uh, matter? I, I just have a question for uh, Mr. Anton. Can I? Yes. Yeah, uh, just uh, the uh, CrossFit business. Um, one of the, you know, one of the problems with CrossFit is that it, the use of it, it's um, oftentimes tends to extend out into the uh, the resident, the streets around it, uh, just with people doing their exercises. Is that uh, a limiting or how any limit that you would have uh, on the uh, uh, on the business owner to uh, prevent that sort of thing? Yeah, we did actually. It did come up uh, because because as 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 it was, uh, the legal counsel I have in helping me negotiate leases has negotiated a couple of these CrossFit leases in her. Uh, in her area and pointed those out and we had put them into the lease. Um, uh, another another uh, um, area that's close to this, Commissioner Hines, is uh, loud music. And we've, we, also, uh, we also accounted for uh, uh, the music decibels being down in, in, our, in our negotiations. Very good, thank you. Okay, anybody else wish to speak on this item? See, uh, hearing uh, no other speakers, we'll close the public hearing and we'll bring it back to the commission for, uh, for our discussion. Anybody wanna lead us off here? Um, I'd like to note that I realized that we um, 
haven't taken this up yet, I'll be asking Paul about this later in the meeting, but the question of adjusting commercial parking requirements in close proximity to the train station is very relevant here that I had proposed to agendize last time. Um, I, I see what uh, staff is describing, but it sounds like the decision is not between we can have this use or we can have exactly what the area plan had, um, had intended. It's that we could have this use now or kind of nothing now. Um, it doesn't sound like there's, uh, we, it sounds like we can absolutely put in a, um, a condition of you know, max occupancy nine. And I think there's even a proposal to require set aside of uh, an escrow for code enforcement, if that's really a concern, or even to put a time limit on the, uh, on the use. But listening to the, the owner, it sounds like it's not really a concern that if it, given that the building is not being torn down and rebuilt, that having something in there until at some point it gets redeveloped into something, uh, a denser, more residential area, it seems like it would be an improvement. And I don't think it's particularly conscionable to to insist that the building remains vacant in the meantime. That's where I'm at at this point. And I'd like to, to continue that, that discussion uh, in the direction that Commissioner Brookbinder is taking it. Uh, I've said my piece uh, a little bit earlier regarding it. Um, handcuffing property owners uh, is very tough. Uh, they have uh, to put food on their, their family's table the same way we all do. And they do that by having tenants uh, in their property. And you cannot uh, always have tenants 100% occupancy. Uh, it doesn't really exist. Um, and so for this uh, person who uh, owns multiple units, obviously multiple properties right there, uh, they've invested in Campbell uh, in the area. And uh, they most likely will be for a while uh, until something bigger can come along in, in terms of a, a, a larger project to be developed or maybe sell. Um, the same Commissioner Brookbinder uh, stated that uh, having what currently exists in there, with, which is nothing or could be nothing, uh, or creating tenant improvements that would, in the short term, uh, give a new tenant uh, some life, uh, a business, and put food on her table as well, too. To me, this is fantastic. Now, I do understand staff's point of view uh, as well. but because this is a planned development, uh, we do have uh, pretty much to look at it as a, as a PD zoning with much more flexibility in the meantime. And I do not foresee uh, something like this uh, where you have some tenant improvements on the interior of a property preventing a larger, uh, maybe demolition or reconstruction later down the road uh, with what maybe the city of Campbell would prefer with their vision. Uh, I'd be hard pressed to, sign, to find a situation where that was the case. Uh, and uh, if somebody would like to bring up an example, that'd be great. But uh, I, I don't think there'll be any harm here. Uh, and that would be, of course, my, my professional opinion on that. Anybody else? Commissioner Hines? So I feel that we need to create a favorable climate for businesses, particularly small businesses. Um, I think we have uh, been slammed by COVID-19 uh, and I think we need to take every opportunity uh, from a small business standpoint to, uh, uh, to recover from that. And it's gonna take a long time. It's gonna take years uh, to do that. Um, you know, small businesses, uh, I, I believe this would generate sales tax. Maybe I could also ask uh, um, uh, the applicant, uh, there'd be some amount of sales tax uh, that revenue that would come from that. Uh, that's one of the biggest shortfalls in the Campbell budget uh, is, is sales tax. Um, we need to build a climate that brings direct incentives and promotions uh, for, uh, for businesses. Um, we've got small, you know, small business owners will will mortgage everything to uh, uh, get uh, programs like this going. Uh, we've got, uh, it sounds like it's, we've got a, uh, a very willing developer, a uh, very willing owner and a very willing uh, app, um, business owner uh, that really wants to uh, make this uh, make this happen. We, uh, we need to give uh, businesses the incentive uh, to, uh, to, to rent this sort of an operation out. Uh, we, and we wanna be able to promote it. 
you know, we've got a, a the climate right now is we got to recover from the COVID-19 hurricane and we got to take it back to the sunny California days. And we're going to do that through um, being able to be supportive of small businesses. Uh, so I would uh, suggest to, um, and I never know which way the, to describe this, to vote against the recommendation of the uh, planning department. So it's to deny the deny. So. Any, anybody else? Commissioner Ostrowski? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to add, um, I concur with my uh, fellow commissioners here. I think the, um, in terms of supporting the business um, and, uh, and working towards filling that, um, that building so that the, um, the residents in the area and the other um, Campbell residents can enjoy a, a fitness center rather than having something remain vacant for a period of time. Um, I guess the, the issue here at hand is the parking and the concern by, um, by staff that they, there will be um, overflow and um, excess cars. I think the, um, the applicants done a nice job of working with the business owner to, uh, to mitigate that and, and align the business uh, with, with the number of parking stalls. I did wanna add that um, in the future, if the, um, if the owner would be interested in uh, increasing the, um, the number of um, customers, I would even be open to that um, if the, you know, if we can do a reevaluation of the number of cars that are, or number of um, customers that are actually driving. So for example, if, if they're really walking and taking public transit, and the parking lot is is relatively empty. Then I would say that that would be an opportunity for the the business to increase um, the the use. Um, but if not, then um, then obviously we, we would we would look at that differently. So I just want to make sure that we're open to that, um, as we've seen in a number of other um, situations that uh, people are taking public transit. Um, they're motivated to get out of their cars and this being right in downtown is, um, is a great, uh, in downtown and really near high density housing is a great um, opportunity to have a fitness studio uh, in that area. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make one quick comment regarding the, the parking modification. Um, uh, truthfully, I think that uh, there's no cookie cutter solution for uh, parking requirements and I think they will continually evolve over the next few decades as they have over the past few decades. And so uh, when I look at the, requ the request for a parking modification, uh, when it's tied into um, a plan development, uh, permanent approval, uh, to me, that is to be expected. That's something that we, would, of course, would see. Uh, I, I think it would be rare to see a new proposal that would fit in perfectly in line with the existing parking uh, requirements. Um, and so, I, I don't. Uh, I don't think that's as big of a deal uh, for me personally. Just talking specifically on that parking uh, permit. That's my piece on that. Thank you, Commissioner Coldwell. I, I guess I'll just give my quick two cents here. And I, you know, so we talk about the highest and best use of the property, and obviously this is better than a vacant property. We all know that. Uh, in terms of the, you know a broad vision, I think you know I, I you know. To me, it's clear, and I guess not to other commissioners, that there's certainly a lot better uses for that particular location. But I do hear our, our, my fellow commissioners and the applicant and the owner, you know, it's a tough situation. So when you come down to the use and you got, we got this versus nothing, and you know, it's a decent use. So I think it does come down to the parking question, but I guess I'll be a little bit of flying the ointment on this one because, uh, and I do, Commissioner Bookbinder's right. You know, we need the we need the broad vision. We need that we need to figure out we need to figure out the parking requirements and just kind of get set on that. Barring that, and this type of use in that area, you know, I use that area. I, I'm in that area quite a bit. I'm a, I'm a very frequent park user. I walk down there a lot. This is really one of the worst areas for parking. So with this kind of and you know you, you try to limit it to nine people, that would be one option. It never really happens. It, it's it's really going to cause, I I think, certainly, in the short term, uh, you know, pretty much of a parking crunch. It's going to be a it could be a pretty tough situation there. And then, 
That's what people come and go, how the, how the heck could you approve that? So I guess because of the parking, because of the lack of parking, uh, I would kind of be leaning against it. Uh, and in terms of the broader vision, you know, that, you know, highest and best use, we got to get what we got now that's doable. Uh, how, how do we encourage or get to the better use? You know, I don't know. That's a tough, long situation. So, uh, so I th for me, it does come down to the parking question. And I think the parking is a big problem. So that's my two cents. Anybody else want to chime in? Yeah, sure, uh, Chair Cray. Um, I, I guess I, I probably lean to your comments, actually. I, um, there is a massive need for housing. And I, I think they've just passed some more legislation or, or requirement to increase height density housing or affordable housing, right? So um, we're well behind where we should be as a city in providing affordable housing. And, you know, this is a 1979 development, right? It's an industrial development dating back, what, 40 years, right? And things change a lot. Um, it's an ideal site for housing. Right? It's not an ideal site anymore for, for industrial or even this type of use it's where i think it's a real race wasted opportunity um now whether this is the right vehicle to do this but i do completely get where the staff are coming from right um you know part of me is thinking well if somebody wants to develop that area this is going to really impact it i i i don't know right i don't think it's going to make it any easier by allowing this this business to to go to go ahead but I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, I, I think perhaps this is something that the city, we need to be looking at as part of the new general plan to take maybe more active measures in in moving these things forward and unblocking these situations where you've got multiple landowners not agreeing. And at the end of the day, we've got something which doesn't change and we're stuck in the past. We have these big housing pr problems and it doesn't change, right? And I think at some stage we we have to make a stand at trying to do this. Um, so you know, you can make an argument to for and against that. Um, going back to you know the uh, the application and the ordinance, you know, it doesn't really uh, it's not really consistent with the PD ordinance because it doesn't improve things. Um, you know, it's removing landscaping, it's removing open space, but is that worth a sacrifice? And I, I do hear what the fellow commissioners say about enabling small business right, in tough times. Um, and then you have the parking, um, and I think the, co the, the staff's comments are relevant on that. And, and like you, I, I use that area a lot. It's a parking nightmare. And it, in fact, it's probably a dangerous parking nightmare because your kids coming out, people cycling there's nowhere to park on the street that car park is the, the Campbell Park car park is always full um, so I, I do think there will be a, um, a a parking issue there um, so I guess a bit on on the fence maybe uh, I think the staff did propose if we wanted to um, deny the denial right um, there would be a, there could be like a, a, a five thousand dollar deposit. I think I read this in in the document lodged by the applicant for code enforcement issues. So if they did go beyond the nine spaces, um, you know, may, maybe that would would help. But I guess I'm still on the fence here. I could <laughs> do, it, do it either way. You know, I, I guess I'm really the type of hung up that this is an ideal opportunity for for housing. Still encouraging things which are forty years old, right? Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Colville. You know, uh, I, I think we've all said um, our piece on it. Uh, I think Commissioner Ching was the last one uh, yeah. of us, yeah. and um, no, we we I, have one more. Okay, okay. I'm sorry if Mr. somebody else would Mr. like to speak. Sure. I don't know if he wants to speak. Oh, you. you uh, uh, he recused himself. Sorry. Andrew, Andrew. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Commissioner Colwell. Sorry. Awesome. Um, I just wanted to see uh, how we go about uh, the alternative. Uh, number one, continuing the item, directing staff to return with the resolution to approve the ac applicant's request. Now, this is where, of course, we wouldn't make a motion to uh, deny this permit uh, as written by staff. We would go the alternate route and condition one, uh, he, we have the option of 
uh, moving forward with or without uh, conditions limiting the duration of the use, requiring a refundable deposit uh, to cover any potential code enforcement costs or otherwise amending or changing operational characteristics of the use of the proposed site configuration. Uh, to be honest, I'd like to continue uh, with the item. Uh, I, I don't personally foresee any uh, conditions being useful regarding money held in escrow uh, for code enforcement. Um, this is again, just my opinion. Uh, I don't think uh, some lump sum of money would, uh, would, would do much. Um, and, I, and I don't think that uh, I have an issue with the parking modification. Uh, so, so for me, I'd like to at least continue with the item uh, and having uh, staff return with a resolution to approve the applicant. Do I need to make a motion for that and have that second? I think you almost did there. Out? Yeah. Why don't you make that motion? Yeah, because I think you're right. Uh, just, just to be sure, what um, did you want to put a condition of the use limiting occupancy to nine people? Because I don't know if that was a part of that already. I have no problem if you'd like to make a motion having that condition. I personally don't find that condition uh, useful in, in the motion I'd like to make. I'd like to, to have the applicant uh, go ahead and move forward with uh, the permit that they have applied for uh, and be able to just have this uh, move forward as fast as possible, uh, removing as many obstacles as possible. Uh, and the obstacles I, I'd speak of would be, you know, the escrow account for code enforcement. Uh, further limiting of the duration of the use and all of these other things that staff would need to work on. We already have a permit uh, application in place through the applicant. Uh, they have submitted this, they've worked with staff diligently. Uh, so for me, I'd like to continue uh, and get that fast track and come back to us for approval without any conditions uh, limiting use. And that would be the motion I'd like to make. I would need a second. Point of, point of clarification, yeah. Mr. Chair. Um, yes. So the five-year limit is actually a code, so you can't waive a, a, a code provision. In terms of the use, this is this is what's before you: is we we have a request for an activity, an operation, a use, and the use. What I'm hearing you say, Commissioner Colville, is the use will be permitted without limitation. Period. So if they want a thousand people there. They could have that. So that, um, I'm a little con confused. So what the proposal, I believe, and Stephen speak, it, it's for nine people. Is that correct? That's correct. And if I could add, um, tonight's item, let's say we find support in the item, we want to say approve it, overturning the denial. What would almost, what would have to happen is we would still need to continue the item, directing staff to return right. with a resolution incorporating findings, supporting the item, as well as conditions of approval. So what we're hearing is we're hearing some comments, um, looking for support of particular items or provisions, five years, not five years. The, the one thing I would mention about the five-year provision in particular, that actually um, was barred from our light industrial section of our code. Fitness facilities in that area are limited by default to five years. So in this particular area, you could impose that as a requirement to try to encourage or spur redevelopment at the end of a five year or 10 year period, you could make up a number that you would feel comfortable. I just wanted to mention that. That's, that's great. And thank you for the additions. The, the, of course, I did not want to, to give a, a get out of jail free card for the applicant to do whatever they like with, with the property. What I am reading is the project uh, data provided, which is just right on page, uh, the end of page one, one, going into page two here and what we have is uh, the lot size, existing building size, the proposed building, and we have everything that they're looking for, parking proposed, nine spaces. Uh, this would be uh, what I would be accepting along with the maximum occupants of nine occupants at peak operation. Uh, what I see in front of us with the project data is what I am assuming that uh, the applicant has applied for and that I'd be willing to uh, make a motion moving forward with us uh, for staff to work on with them specifically. Um, we can, by all means, we can staff in a five-year uh, limit of use, or they'd have to at least re renew the, the, the lease. But the lease itself is going to be something negotiated in between uh, the tenant and the building owner themselves. So if we step in and add one more layer of regulation, uh, in between that, the, the waters uh, might get muddied. Um, and so this is uh, something where I, I don't feel like we're going to have a fitness studio 
uh, sign a 100 year lease that will lock up this building forever that she would never be able to be bought out of. This, this seems like it's uh, nonsensical to me. And so that, that's why I don't propose uh, limiting the use to a certain period of time. I'd like to see uh, the applicant be able to work that out with the tenants uh, the way it naturally happens in the business world when it comes to tenant uh, relationships. And does, does that clarify, uh, Mr. Komoyan, uh, your question? Right. So what I'm what I'm hearing you say, Commissioner Colville, is um, you would like to accept the alternative number one to uh, request the continuance in order to return with a resolution of approval uh, that removes the five thousand um, dollar deposit as well as any limited duration, uh, but still maintains the occupancy at nine. That is correct. The project data provided is what I'm going on off of that. And so the max occupants would be nine. The proposed parking sure. spaces required would also be nine as well. Okay. Commissioner, Commissioner Colville, I, um, I, I agree with everything you're saying and I'll vote for well, whichever way you go. Uh, but I do feel that uh, it does make sense to build an escrow fund uh, for uh, uh, potential issues that the, uh, may come up that have to be addressed. Yeah, I, I, can, I agree with you, Commissioner, Commissioner Hines. Yeah, I agree with Commissioner Hines. And I'd also like to put that five-year limit in there as well. If, if those two were in there, I would go for it. Is, uh, uh, Director Kamoyan, how often do we see uh, escrow accounts held for code enforcement? Is this common? <laughs> we, we do uh, receive those. It is common. Um, in in most cases though, uh, we, we tend not to use them, they become unnecessary, but it's all good to have. Um, and we have a list, we monitor that list, and then after so many years, we'll return the money. I understand, and, and, and we're working with a tenant who has multiple properties in the same vicinity uh, in Campbell. Uh, seems like a trustworthy trustworthy client, uh, and, and Director Kamoyan just stated that they seem to be unnecessary. This would be my take it on uh, on it as well too. Um, so I, I would I would like to keep the escrow fund uh, out of it, uh, and then I would also like to to, to not add that layer of um, of a five year uh, use on that. I, I agree uh, that there are certain things that might be useful. Uh, this not, in my opinion, not being one of them. Uh, the tenant uh, and uh, so ahead. I yeah, yeah I just want to add. You know I. I think it's important to have that um, 5K in escrow. The cities, I mean, we're basically making um, concessions here in terms of the parking to move this forward. So I think that's a reasonable compromise. Um, and I, I don't support limiting the use um, to five years because I think if we do in five years, we might be in the same situation. And you know, for me, if the, if the property owner um, wants to redevelop it um, at that time, they're gonna, set their lease structure in such a way that's going to um, allow them to do that. Otherwise, if we put a limit on it, we might end up being in the same situation um, in five years that we are in today, meaning that the market setting may not be um, right for that redevelopment at that time. And that's the reason I don't support limiting the use. So community director, do you need a motion from us or do you, are you just taking notes as feedback? Well, I think we, we well, had a motion. We'll need a motion, yes, to, to continue. I, I did want to offer just kind of a compromise from what I'm hearing Commissioner Colville and, and some of the other commissioners talk about. The, the purpose of a deposit, of course, is to help fund any future, and hopefully not, uh, code enforcement activities. Uh, what you, we could do, though, is just put as a condition of approval that the applicant is uh, agreeing to the fact that any future code enforcement activities uh, they would have to pay for. And that way we're not taking in the money, they're agreeing up front and we're not going to have a debate on uh, the, the costs. I think that's a great idea. Um, yeah. That, that yeah. May so be, the attorney. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that may be a great idea, but there are some very, well, Essentially, you're establishing a, a new fee, and we would have to uh, have to. I, I'm not saying it's impossible to do, but it would be 
challenging. We would have to come up with rates to set and various findings to make in support of the of the fee that we're essentially establishing for for this code enforcement. Um, it, it, I, I'm not saying it can't be done, but it, it presents challenges that we haven't faced generally. Are owners generally not liable for code enforcement fees if they haven't paid an escrow up front? That seems odd. Um, th that, that actually is correct generally. Um, we can recover, well, we can recover certain costs actually in, through the code enforcement process. Uh, if it goes to like uh, a legal challenge in court or something like that, we generally cannot recover attorney's fees uh, unless we elect that in advance, which also, which also gives them the right to recover if they should prevail. So generally it's not something we do. So the escrow fees actually change the incidence of the cost of, um, of code enforcement. It's not just prepaying in the event that something goes wrong. It actually changes who will eventually have to pay for it. No. Not necessarily. It, it does uh, give us something to collect against because collection is always the most difficult part in, in terms of collecting any penalty or uh, any costs involved. Because otherwise, we, the best we could do is put a lien against their property and we may not see the funds for years. So I'd like to, uh, I don't know if we still have a motion rolling. Commissioner well, we, do have a, we do have a motion rolling. Uh, Commissioner Hyatt, just before we make the motion, though, I will, my quick two cents is, yeah, I, I definitely think the 5,000 is a really a good idea, but I also think the five-year limitation is really a good idea. You know, it doesn't preclude the applicant or the, the, the user from coming back in five years and trying to re-up, but I think that's kind of a, a little good safeguard to put in there, but... Uh, I'm probably voting against the motion anyway, but I just wanted to put my two cents in there. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, so I, I, a, I agree. I agree. Do we have a, uh, I guess, do we have a motion? I think we have a motion, right, Commissioner Colville? Or do you wanna, we do. You we do. And, and with respect to everybody's input, we've spent a lot of time, which I, I think is great. Uh, my motion will not include an escrow number uh, because that is arbitrary. It also will not uh, include a, a duration of use for what Commissioner Ostrowski has pointed out. Uh, these are arbitrary figures and numbers that we're, we seem to be throwing out. Um, I think letting business uh, as usual go would be fantastic. So the motion I'm making would be to uh, continue with this uh, per uh, the recommendation of the staff here with uh, option number one, continuing the item, directing staff to return with the resolution to approve the applicant's request. Uh, we did not put a five-year limit uh, on, on this one here or an escrow account. Um, we do have, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, the project data being uh, what is uh, upheld in this motion. So we are sticking with the nine occupants at a peak operation. Uh, and then, of course, with the uh, nine spaces for the parking uh, as well, too. And then staff would work uh, hand in hand uh, moving forward with the applicant. Okay, okay. Uh, well, that's good. Now, do we have a second? Do we have a second? I'll second. Second. Okay. Uh, Corrine, can we have a, uh, a vote? Commissioner Bookbinder. Aye. Commissioner Chang? No. Commissioner Colville? Aye. Commissioner Hines? Aye. Commissioner, oh, sorry. Vice Chair Ostrowski? Aye. And Chair Cray? A uh, no. Okay, so that's a, a four, two, and one, one uh, abstain. One, one abstention. So that, uh, that item now will come back to a, at a future meeting. We don't know when, but soon with uh, the direction to staff for the approval. And uh, this item is closed. And we'll wait for Commissioner Rivlin to rejoin us wherever he may be. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, being a property owner in Campbell, Mr. Anpon. Thank you. And Mr. Wong, thank you for being a, uh, uh, I believe you're the property developer, thank you. Commissioner Colville, uh, Rivlin, is he back? Let's give him a little couple minutes. Should we take a five minute break?
You guys want a break? No. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a five oh, minute no. break. <laughs> Stay there. Who, there. Very who good. wants a five minute break? <laughs> I want to go. Yeah. Okay, five minute break. Five minute. Guys. All right. Let's come back in five. <laughs> Uh, this is Commissioner Rivlin. I'm rejoining. Yeah, we're taking a five minute break. Five minute break, bro. Andrew, thank you. Okay. Well, while we're taking a break here, Commissioner Ostrowski, are you unmuted? Congratulations, Commissioner Ostrowski. Congrats. Oh, thanks. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> Everything's oh, great. So far, so good. good. Little uh, Eliza is sleeping. She does that a lot. <laughs> That's great. Luckily. That's great. We got to be able to see her at some point. Yeah, you might, you might, we might get lucky. <laughs> she might make her way over here for two seconds and then she'll quickly, you know, make her exit. <laughs> oh, that'd be fun to see. Yeah.
Okay, we'll wait for our two more commissioners here. I'm back. There we go. Okay. And Commissioner Rivlin, is he in? I am. There we go. Okay, I guess we're back. So everybody's back. Let's uh, resume the meeting. Uh, item number two. This is the con uh, continued public hearing to consider the application of Nandindi Bachacharaya and Budeda Basu for a variance PLN 2019-176, sorry for my pronunciations, to allow a reduced side yard setback to legalize an unpermitted accessory dwelling unit, ADU, on property located at 309 Reading Road. Staff is recommending that this item be deemed categor categorically exempt under CEQA and our Project planner is Daniel Fama. Thank you. Good evening. Give me one moment and I'll share my screen and begin the presentation. Okay, I'm having a little difficulty getting into presentation mode, but uh, we'll just do it the uh, slightly old fashioned way. So this is an application for a variance to legalize a unpermitted accessory dwelling unit. This uh, hearing was continued from December 10th. Uh, that meeting resulted in a 3-3 tie, uh, which required the meeting to be rescheduled to a subsequent time. Unfortunately, due to scheduling conflicts early in this year, and then of course the uh, COVID uh, closure, uh, the item could not be continued until now. The project site is a 10,000 square foot lot on Reading Road located west of Bascom Avenue, located within the R16 zoning district and not within any special plan area. Uh, it's developed with a single family residential home that was constructed around 1940. Uh, this matter was first brought to the city's attention approximately two years ago with a code enforcement case alleging uh, construction or alleging presence of a unpermitted accessory dwelling unit. At the time, it appeared to be a classic uh, legal garage conversion where a garage was converted to a living unit. Um, normally, that situation would be permissible under current state law that allows garages to be converted in place to ADUs. However, uh, upon further review, it was found that it was actually the structure that was an illegal addition and then subsequently was converted to an ADU. And therefore, because of that history, it was not easily able to be legalized. Uh, such the applicant's only recourse was to apply for a variance. Uh, the ADU shown here towards the rear of the lot, uh, again, as noted, this was originally constructed as some sort of expansion to the ex existing garage structure uh, which is shown here. Uh, this probably occurred in the late 80s or early 1990s. Now the applicants have provide uh, some floor plans. Uh, we see the interior of a 450 square foot, one bedroom, one bathroom living unit. The variance specifically would allow a reduction to the side yard setback where normally a four foot setback is required as built the structures approximately 10 inches to the side property line. As discussed in greater detail in your staff report, uh, in order to approve a variance, a planning commission must, must establish certain findings under state law. Uh, these are noted here. Uh, as discussed, these findings pertain largely to physical constraints of the property and not so much to buildings or the individual property owners uh, personal or financial situation. Uh, largely having to do with the lot being much larger than normal. As a R16 lot, this is a 10,000 square foot lot, meaning that it is 4,000 square feet larger than typical, uh, meaning the lot is quite large and can easily accommodate an ADU under normal circumstances. And since the applicant's the written statements largely rest on a contention that the cost is the primary factor that requires a variance. Uh, it's pretty evident under state law that financial considerations 
are not a factor for a variance approval. And as such, uh, staff recommends that four of the five findings cannot be met, which would require denial of the variance. Uh, additionally, I just wanted to point out several other factors. Uh, based on some materials that were provided by the applicant, just wanted to highlight factors that are not relevant to the variance. Again, personal financial issues are not relevant. Uh, disputes with the property <coughs> seller and or the agent, uh, whether or not certain issues or permits were not disclosed. Uh, those are civil matters not relevant to the variance. Uh, comparison to R110 zone properties are also not relevant. Uh, while the property is 10,000 square feet, it is zoned R16, so it needs to be compared to comfortably zoned properties. And again, because of that, for that reason, this lot is actually significantly advantage to R16 properties being 4,000 square feet larger than normal. Uh, additionally, previous city permits for re-roofing and interior remodel the main house are not relevant to the legality of the ADU. Uh, comparison to San Jose's ADU's uh, rules are also not relevant. Of course, it's a separate city and they're allowed to have their own set of standards distinct from Campbell as this is city. And then lastly, uh, there's some, there was some discussion at the previous meeting as well as in the applicant's materials regarding the state's five-year deferred enforcement program kind of a limited term amnesty. The way that program has been structured under state law, it only applies to building code violations. Uh, so if the structure had been legal from day one and the garage had been converted, that would have simply been a building code violation. But by virtue of the building being expanded without permits, that constituted a zoning code violation as well. And because of that, the state's deferred enforcement program does not apply. In conclusion, staff does recommend that the Planning Commission adopt a resolution denying the variance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, any questions uh, for Daniel? I have a question. Just to, oh, yes. Um, Daniel, I was curious um, about the two documents that were submitted. Um, one is called the application for the moving permit from 1974. Um, and the reason I'm asking about that is because you had stated that the addition was likely built in the 80s or 90s illegally. But when I look at this permit, um, it specifies the building width and length of the main house being 26 by 49. And then it says additional structures width and length. Um, and I'm happy to share this so everybody can see what I'm talking about. So we're all... Please do. Yeah, okay, let me do that. Um, as long as I can get um, permission, I'm happy to share it. All right. It's on page 85 of the agenda packet as a heads up as well. Okay, perfect, yep. So when I look at this, um, this building width um, and length, this looks like it's the main house. And then here it says additional structures width and length, and it says, basically that there are two, one is 21 by 24, and the second one is 20 by 21. And that seems to agree with that um, garage being about 20 feet wide and about 45 to 50 feet um, deep. So I'm curious if um, this would support the fact that um, this structure was built legally because um, it seems to have existed in 1974. And this looks like a permit application and therefore um, it was um, the, the building department seems to have been aware of it um, back then. So these were county moving permits and we did actually explore this avenue. Um, had this established legality of the structure, uh, the planning commission's involvement would not have been warranted since a variance would have not been required and the structure could have simply been converted legally through issuance of a building permit. Uh, we actually did reach out to the building department representatives that the applicant spoke to at Santa Clara County and actually asked if they would provide a letter in writing from the county saying that these documents stipulate to the legality of these structures, of the structure. And they were not willing to do that. And because of that, it wasn't entirely clear that this was sufficient to really document the legality of the building. Uh, 
And fortunately, uh, we had also looked at some additional aerial photography that strongly suggested that the expansion occurred uh, prior, following annexation into the city. Which would have been when? Uh, I'm afraid I don't have that information handy at the moment. But again, I just want to reiterate too that the question of legality or not, that is solely a administrative function uh, that belongs to the director. Um, the fact that we are here really is a contention by the applicant who's effectively stipulated that the structure is not legal and hence they are applying for a variance. If they felt that the city erred in the determination of the permit history and the providence of the building, uh, that would have required an entirely different administrative remedy uh, than the one they have applied for today. So if, if I could just jump in, um, be, because of this issue, and, and we were getting bombarded with all these old documents, personally um, perform the aerial chronology review. And I did provide that information to you, Daniel, as well as the applicant that clearly showed um, at this time a much smaller garage and then later a larger garage. So that's where the, the argument uh, made that well, it was always there fell apart. And I just, I just needed to be certain. And we do have aerial photography uh, going back, uh, you know, to 74 and forward. So I was able to see the transition of an addition that occurred after. Yeah, that's noted on page three of the staff report where the, um, the photography shows that it looks like the garage expanded uh, in the late 1980s or early 1990s. Yeah. Okay, Commissioner Colville, I think you have a question. Just a quick question to staff here. Um, now, we've, we've seen many things. Uh, Commissioner Ostrowski brought this one up here, the moving permit. A few others we've seen provided by the applicant uh, include the uh, uh, home warranty, uh, things regarding when they purchase the property. Uh, and I'd like to clarify that although some of these things might uh, acknowledge the existence of a structure that is this size, it does not clarify legality. That is correct, right? That is correct. Thank you. Any, any other questions for Daniel, anybody? Uh, just to clarify, um, when this came up back in the last December, we also talked about the plausibility of redrawing property lines so that there was enough of a setback there, but this meant that even if the neighboring property owner would agree to such a swap, um, that the lot size is not conforming so that that wouldn't be plausible anyway. Is that, is that correct? Well, I believe, I mean, the lot size currently is already uh, too narrow. It's 55 feet. So they would need to at least pick up four and a half feet or 55 and a half. They would need to pick up four and a half feet to round it out to 60. And I think that would level of land would start to encroach into the setbacks for the neighboring property. Thank you. Any other, any other questions for Daniel? Okay, no other questions, and we'll open up the public. We'll open up the public hearing, and I know that uh, you got a question. I think from Commissioner Rivlin. Yes, this is Commissioner Rivlin. Um, Daniel and staff, did the applicant, um, based on the reading of the applicant's material and the notes in the uh, packet, I understand there was no interest in exploring adjustment to the building at all. Is that correct? I believe that was an alternative we had uh, discussed as as something that could take place offline of uh, moving walls. And then as I reviewed the packet, I noticed the applicant has been firm in saying it, insinuating it costs too much. And we can ask the applicant, but I just wondered what happened behind the scenes over the last uh, four or five months. Well, that had communicated the same, that effectively to conform to the setback would have required pushing that wall in about three feet, and that's the wall where the kitchen is located. But I think we agreed, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the, wall, the structure wall could stay in the same place. We were just going to add a, a, a faux interior wall that would create storage within the overall structure. Did, did they explore that? 
Uh, no, they're still seeking their ability, their desire to legalize the structure as is. Okay, thank you. Any more questions, anybody? All right, well, let's yeah, open up. Some... I just wanted to find oh, out. Yes. So on that, um, on that um, document that I was referring to on the next page, it references a building permit number. Um, was, did we, were we ever able to track down that um, building permit? You know, it was several months ago. This was a discussion we had with them uh, late last year. And we did look at all the associated permits and I did discuss it with Paul. And believe me, if there was a way to document that these permits showed clear legality, that would have avoided this entire process. And it would have been helpful too if the county had provided some sort of letter. I mean, for instance, here in Campbell, if someone asked for a letter to document whether or not something's legal, we actually do that for a fee that's relatively nominal. We will prepare a zoning letter that says that a building or a property was built in such and such year under such and such permit and that it is legal to the city's current understanding. Had the county been willing to do that based on that documentation, uh, that would have been sufficient for us. Uh, we are not experts in reading or comprehending the county's permits from that era, and we didn't need them to do that, and they refused. So, what, uh, so I just wanted to understand, did they not do that because they didn't have the records that are referenced in this document? Is that the reason why they declined the request? I can't speculate as to why. I mean, the applicants told me that the individual that they spoke to verbally told them that this was sufficient, but absent them putting that in writing, we obviously simply can't take their word for it. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, folks, so we'll, uh, let's open up the, uh, the public hearing and I know the applicants want to speak, so uh, the applicants can address the commission now. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Nandini Vattacharya. Can I speak now? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Let me just uh, share the screen. I want to show my house once. Uh, can you uh, see my screen? No. Not yet. I think Cecil has to do something. Don't, don't you, Cecil? No. Uh, let me double check. Um, one second. No, no. I did it actually. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so uh, I will just uh, start. Uh, my name is Nandini Bhattacharya and I reside at 309 Reading Road, Campbell. I would like to thank the Planning Commission for your time. Uh, we have done our due diligence after we purchased the property in 2015. We have tried to get the ADU legalized in 2016 and hired an architect. The contract is attached as part of the agenda documents. Also from the day we received the first letter from code enforcement from the city of Campbell, we have uh, followed the process to the book and done everything asked for of us. The city staff can attest to that. We have received no objection letters from all our immediate neighbors, which goes on to say that they are okay with the existence of the ADU as is. There is an ADU forum maintained by senior planner, Mr. Daniel Fema, where there are around 150 Campbell residents. Numerous folks from there have voiced their support towards the variance. There is also the matter of environmental impact, which was mentioned by the commission. Uh, Next, I want to say that the state of California is pro ADU. All new laws from 2017 to 20 establishes that. It also includes the five-year deferment of, for building code. Governor Newsom's intent is to increase housing with minimal changes to existing structures. The push is on the safety of these units. So keeping in mind the vision of the state of California, we have to see that if we are making the right decision by reducing the usefulness of the ADU unit. There has been talk about how our variance 
if accepted, may cause a precedent for other similar cases, which also we have showed that there is another case. This is the first ADU case after California SB 13. If Campbell is reluctant to grant the variance to an unit which is renovated, which meets all the new building codes and safety requirements and been there for decades, how will the numerous unpermitted units out there react and feel encouraged to come forward? Some of those might be unsafe without the owners knowing about it. We have a garage plus five feet of the existing ADU, which will not be impacted with this process. So they will remain like that. So the city staff's question about its effect on the beautification and aesthetics of the city is invalid. Even if we consider that, then from the front of our house, only the garage is visible, which will still be at 10 inches from the property line. Also, we have additional data that we have acquired in the last six months, would humbly request the commission to go through the new attachments in the agenda packet. And another point I want to bring up, uh, why we came to the variance application. So we came to know that this is not a uh, legalized unit only when we tried to submit the, uh, uh, submit our plan to Mr. Senior Planner, Mr. Fema. He mentioned uh, that the lot is substandard in size. And my husband can tell that about it. Also, it is existing for more than three decades. So he, he told us that, so apply to the planning commission, which consists of Campbell residents who may look at it with a different perspective. And furthermore, I believe some of the commissioners visited our home uh, to due diligence. Uh, you have our gratitude and we would love to answer any follow-up questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, What's the, um, thank you for the presentation. What's the uh, yellow, red, and blue line indications? Um, let me answer that. Uh, so this is the property we have, and the red line that you have, you can see, is the garage and ADU all together. Yeah. Uh, the blue line differentiates the garage and the ADU, and wow. the yellow box that I've highlighted is the portion of the ADU in question. So as my wife mentioned, uh, the five feet, we don't have any questions about that. It's the yellow box that is beyond the five feet uh, that is uh, we are having this discussion about. And that's a uh, straight line on the building from the garage and the roof yeah. is what I saw when I looked at it today. Right. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. It is uh, like a continuous building. And uh, if beautification of the city is in question, that doesn't serve the purpose because the front of the, from the front of the house, from the road, you can see the garage and garage is going to remain like that because it's a valley structure, legal structure. And uh, Commission, actually, okay. I have a couple of uh, further data that I've shared in my presentation. Uh, if you give me the permission, I can quickly go through that. Uh, the uh, the uh, city's staff and Mr. Uh, the senior planner, Mr. Pema, mentioned that we are stressing our case based on the financial burdens. But during the last six months, we also gathered data on the topographical structure of our land. And as it shows in this uh, diagram, uh, that uh, our land is quite narrow. And uh, though it's R16, we are still four and a half feet, as Mr. Fema mentioned, shorter of R16 requirement. So it's actually not confirming. And uh, I did uh, go through the city map and I did a little bit of homework. And actually I'm an engineer by profession. And so the logic, uh, my logic is based on numbers and data. So uh, the thing is that uh, our land, which is about a uh, thousand square feet, uh, by definition, it could be under R110 and the minimum width requirement over there is 80 feet. Uh, but we are zoned under R16 where the width requirement is 60 feet, but we are 55 and a half, which is still four and a half feet less than what it needs to be. So we don't suffice R110 and R16 zoning requirements, but uh, we, are, uh, we are compared to a 10,000 square feet lot uh, by, uh, by the city staff. So uh, the thing is that I, I did a little bit of math and shared, uh, tried to share with you uh, the irregularity of the nature of the land when compared to all the lots in the city of Campbell. The numbers falls less than 2% when compared against all residential lots, and it's around 0.2% when compared against lots greater than uh, 10,000 square feet. Uh, this math and numbers have more than two times error margin a building. Uh, also, Campbell City says that uh, the data that I provided has, they have no way of 
to gather this data. And uh, so that's why they disagree to accept that. Uh, the county tax document has the land width and length of each and every lot. So uh, the data is available. You just have to go and collect it. Uh, the above number falls under the category of exception and goes a long way to establish that our lot size is irregular or as an exception. Uh, if the city staff disagrees, then I expect them to challenge the data with counter data. Cities have mentioned that we have 66% more area for construction. Uh, so we, if you are compared against 6,000 square feet lot, then the comparison should be fair. Given the width of 55 feet and we have an unnatural aspect ratio, uh, we should apply the same comparable sizes with the aspect ratio of 0.3. That means then if you're comparing a 6,000 square feet unit, you should com compare a unit or a lot which has a width of 42 feet and a length of 143 feet. Uh, because then only it's similar uh, to our lot and is a fair comparison. But the point to note is that whether Campbell City will allow a lot with such width and length, and even further, if we have such lots in existence in the city of Campbell. I will also like to mention uh, that there we have around 12 trees, out of which eight trees are in our backyard. We have really, if you look at the time when we have bought the property versus how it is today, we have filled uh, it out with a lot of green trees at the backyard. Uh, these trees are about 15 feet high, so if we are, though we are not developers and ordinary homeowners, for argument's sake, if we consider the relocation of the EDU, are, is the city suggesting us to uproot all these trees? Uh, and uh, I, I would like to open up the forum uh, you know, for questions that uh, the commission or the city staff may have. And uh, I'd like to also appreciate uh, the commissions and the city staff's time uh, that, uh, that has been spent on this case. Thank you so much. Yeah, yes, sir. Th thank you. And while you're while you're uh, while you're right there, let me uh, let me ask you a quick question because you brought it up, and I I think it's first of all I do apologize for the length of time that this has taken. I know uh, I thank God, thank you for your patience. But let me ask you what, about your uh, research, and I love that you did the research. Only fifteen lots greater than ten thousand square feet with less than fifty five square feet. The city couldn't you know couldn't. Uh, couldn't vouch for the numbers, although there's no reason to doubt them. But I wanted to just ask you if you're sure that uh, on your numbers, that those are the total number of lots that would, that this kind of situation might fall into. Yeah, so uh, we, no, Commissioner, we have been at it for a while and this is our home. So uh, I've been trying everything that is possible on our end uh, to do due diligence and make sure that we make our case uh, practical. So I, one night I spent around five hours going through the city map and Google uh, uh, Earth I have Google up in, installing my desktop and there is a ruler over there. Uh, the accuracy of the ruler might be in question, but I saw that it's within the vicinity of around 80 to 90% accurate. So uh, I looked at each and every lot and I saw I could find only 15 lots which kind of matches uh, or is higher than, uh, which matches our uh, aspect ratio. Uh, then I thought that, okay, 15 lots is there uh, and uh, you know uh, let's build, build in some error margin. So I build in two times error margin. So that's 30 lots. And that's when I put in the map. Yeah. So, yeah. and then when the numbers I quote you, I quote you not at 0.165%, I quoted at 0.2 and 2%. So there is additional error margin put in. So uh, the numbers are over there and uh, you know uh, we can put in extra work to go into the county and figure out whether these numbers are kind of accurate as it's supposed to be. But even if you add further error margin, we, I have the point I'm trying to make is that we'll still be within the less than 5% uh, uh, of the Campbell lots that is there. So uh, this number speaks, uh, uh, you know, uh, speaks a lot. It says about, it talks about the irregularity of the land and we wanted the commission to know about it. Okay, well, yeah, no, thank you. That, that was good research. Uh, any, anybody else have questions for the applicants? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah Commissioner Gold. Um, I have a quick question regarding um, the discussion at hand, the irregular size of the lot. Uh, there are a lot of parcels in, in the Bay Area. Surely not every single parcel can uh, have a lawfully permitted ADU unit. Um, yet this entire discussion, uh, what I hear is that you feel entitled to an ADU that would not be approved uh, if you were to apply for permits for it uh, to build uh, right now. So the question I have for you is, is, why do you feel so entitled to have something that nobody else in the city of Campbell could have, which is uh, an ADU that is in the current uh, position of a lot your size? Uh, 
Commissioner, I'm not entitled to uh, for anything out here other than a due diligence and a due process. So uh, you are the people who will decide whether uh, uh, my application makes sense or not. Uh, what I'm trying to do over here is to provide enough data and to do uh, you know, enough work on my end so that I have the satisfaction to say that, okay, uh, I have done and I provided all the data that I could. So uh, I am not entitled, I'm, I never mentioned I am, but uh, I, what I need uh, and I ask, I'm asking for is due process. Yeah, and actually can... just to clarify that, um, uh, Planner Fama, I thought that it was um, allowed to have an extension of a side yard encroachment. So I just wanted to um, understand whether the question was. Um, sure. So there is actually a distinction. A, um, a garage can be legally expanded along a non-conforming setback line. So had this garage been expanded 20 years ago with a permit, and yes, it could have been legalized. But unfortunately, because it was not, that exception does not apply because our code uh, specifically prohibits ADUs from doing what's occurring here. Um, the idea with that is that state law allows garages to be converted in place because those structures are in existence, neighbors are aware that they're there. And it was not thought to be appropriate to allow those buildings to get bigger, particularly along uh, substandard setbacks. Uh, so out of curiosity. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, just real quick. You, you mentioned that it's allowable if if I understand this correctly, it's allowable to take a garage and extend the garage and then convert it into an ADU, but that's not what they did. Well, it had in the past, prior to 2017, the garage been extended with a permit, then it could have been converted legally. But under our current rules, you cannot, you can no longer do that because again, the intent of the state legislation dealing with garage conversions was to allow the buildings to be converted in place as they currently exist at the time of conversion. Uh, so we do have some language that was intended to prevent uh, that loophole from being exploited. So Again, this all goes back to that expansion not being legal from day one. Okay, so if it had been, so it would not, for example, be reasonable for them to turn off the utilities to return it to a garage in name, legalize the expansion of the garage and then turn the utilities back on and make it back into an ADU. Correct, that actually would not be allowed because the garage, as we define an existing garage, it had to exist prior to January 1, 2017. So this new expanded garage would exist after that point in time and thus actually not be eligible for conversion. Okay. I guess, you know, getting back to my original question, I'm, I guess I have a little bit of concern about calling it illegal. It seems like based on the documentation we have that reference permits, those permits are just, um, we, we just can't locate those permits, but there is reference to permits from the, from Santa Clara County. If, if I could just reiterate what I said, um, we have a photo of it in 1974 that refutes what you're saying, Vice Chair. It shows a smaller building. And then when the city annexed, and now we're a city under city laws, it got bigger without a permit. So we, we see the photo, so I, I'm, I'm a little confused. Um, well, the, we but the permit information that's referenced, it says 1975 is, the, there's two documents and one talks about when yeah. 1974, the other one talks about 1975. But anyway, I, I guess there is a lot of unknowns it, here. Well, the, the, we too were very confused with those old permits and old permits are hard to read. That is why I had the idea, well, let, let me go back and see a chronology with aerial photography. We do that all the time with code enforcement. It's like no play structure, no play structure. Well, ah, hey, there's a play structure. What's the date? And, and that's how we document. And that's that's information then we use in a court of law. It's, it's visual, it's there, it's precise versus scripted language that has no plans and, and no context. So we, we, we wanted to exhaust 
that aspect because of the confusion. I apologize, we, we don't have the, the aerials attached to this report though, it would have been very clear. Mm -hmm. Yes, and again, to the extent that the applicants have actually submitted for a variance, so they have in effect stipulated the fact that the building is not legal. If they felt otherwise, they should have they should have proceeded with a different course of action and worked with the city attorney and been probably taken as the court and compel a judge to confirm that these permits were legal or not. Uh, by going this route, we effectively have to accept that the building is not legal. Is that question is not within the commission's purview. The whole variance is predicated on this not being legal. So I had a, a few more questions uh, for the okay. applicants. Uh, do you guys mind? Sure. No, go ahead, Commissioner Colvin. Perfect. Thank you guys for your patience. Um, and this is directed straight to the applicants, guys. Um, you mentioned about 15 minutes ago that you found out that things were non conforming, non permitted uh, when you went to. Um, legalize the structure. Uh, can you clarify when, at, at what point you, you discovered uh, uh, these things uh, were not? Yeah. Commissioner uh, Colvin, uh, the thing is that uh, there is some sequence of events in the presentation that uh, I have provided. Uh, let me just bring that up. Uh, that will be easier for me to answer because I have listed down uh, the history of uh, our, uh, you know, uh, the history of the sequence and what happened uh, from the point we purchased this property. So uh, I believe you can see my screen. So yes. uh, we purchased property in 2015. And what happened is we looked at the MLS at that point of time. The MLS listed this property as 1900 square feet with four bed, 3.5 bath. And uh, as I mentioned in our uh, December 10th session, we were excited to get our offer uh, approved. And we got into, uh, we looked at the city permits. So uh, the city permits were there where there was entire roofing, re-roofing was done and there was remodeling and there were multiple uh, like around two to three city inspection visits. So that kind of told us that, okay, this has been reviewed and looked at. So there's nothing to be suspicious about. And we gave the escrow deposit of 36,000. At that point, not even that point, uh, today's uh, market also, that's a significant amount of money. So we put that money and then the appraisal came. The appraisal came at, uh, you know, what it is right now. It's not even what it is right now. The appraisal came at three ba uh, bath, 2.5, uh, 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 three bed, 2.5 bath at 1334 square feet. So we went back to the seller and we said that, okay, this doesn't match with the MLS that you have given with the package, the you know, the seller's package that you have given. Uh, so they said that, okay, fine, take us to court. Uh, we will not return your uh, 3% and you can pursue us uh, for that money in the uh, in court. Uh, you accepted the offer, you knew, you saw the property, you have all the data that you needed. Uh, the thing is that uh, commissioner, $36,000 is a significant amount of money. And we were kind of at the border margin for buying the house, putting the down payment. So we didn't want to lose that money. And we looked around and we saw that uh, the picture, the previous picture that I've shown, uh, there's a lot of units uh, that is scattered around. And in Campbell, we have a lot of issues like that. So our agent kind of advised us, you will not get a house, you have got something, take it, go from there. So, but then when we got the house, it kind of bothers us uh, that, okay, we have something that is illegal. So it kind of bothers us and we kind of got, uh, as soon as we could gather some money, we got in 2016, we hired an architect to legalize the in-law unit. So then uh, we got into a contract and then the architect visited the city office and was told that, you know, it's not possible to be legalized because our land is 9,980 9, square feet. So because at that point, 10,000 square feet was a requirement to have an ADU. So he asked me that not to pursue this because there will be no point in that. But then uh, once we got into code enforcement office from 2018, we, we, we went into the county office and they corrected our records and the rock size came into, I think, uh, uh, 10,023 square feet. Daniel has the correct data. And then we kind of uh, went through this code enforcement and then uh, you have the whole history. By the way, in the middle, we found out when we hired the uh, architect, he measured the house again. Uh, we found that our house is actually not 1334 square feet, but it's actually 1215 square feet. So there is a lot of inconsistency in terms of records that we kept for this house. We are kind of digging through this and getting the data as and when, uh, as and when we can. But uh, we did a lot of homework and uh, this is where we stand today. Perfect, thank you for your explanation. Uh, my curiosity is stemmed from the, uh, the fact that you provided us with your, uh, your seller's disclosure packet. And uh, if anybody has a PDF open, 
Uh, you can jump to page 121 here, and this is where uh, a seller must disclose something on a property uh, that they know about. This is very important in the uh, real estate industry. Uh, this is an industry I, I currently work in, and so of course this is something I would I would look at right away when I was buying a house. And what we do see here, uh, sir, is that uh, they did mark uh, yes on number four, uh, which is are, are you the seller aware of any of the following? Number four is room additions, structural modifications, or other alterations or repairs made without permits. He marked yes and then wrote in the notes bath and kitchen remodel. He further marked box 10, which is any zoning violations, non-conforming uses, violations of setback requirements, marked yes and said that garage is closer to property line uh, than it should be. This is relevant only because of course, at this point before you made an offer to the property uh, or moved forward with it uh, and accepted the sale, uh, there was disclosure and acknowledgements in place. Um, so at that point, you were made aware of this, uh, your agent would have had to disclose this to you, you would have seen this packet. Um, so you knew at this point in time that uh, there was the potential for this issue to come up, is that correct? Is that a question for us? That, that's a question for the applicant, correct. Yes, so no, we, we did not know before putting the uh, 3% deposit. That's the answer. We did not know anything about this is being illegal. We did not know that. But the question that was asked before that did we know, buy the house knowing that there, there is an illegal unit? That's correct. Yes, we knew when we kind of bought the house at that point, we had that knowledge that uh, it's not actually a four bath, three point five, uh, four bed, 3.5 bath. It's actually a three bed, 2.5 bath legal structure. Great. And then, and so that means you did also see the notes that were written by the seller, which were the bath and kitchen remodel and the garage being closer to the property line than it should be. Is that correct? After the, we put in the escrow, when the appraisal came, that was in pure black and white. At that point, we realized it. And then when we went to the seller. I see. Great. Thank you for answering that one. And I did have one more question for you guys. Uh, now you mentioned on page 112 of the agenda, uh, if anybody has it open, please jump right to it. Uh, 112. Uh, what we're looking at here um, is the use of the ADU, and it says here, uh, in-laws used by, this is on the right side here, uh, the in-laws unit. Uh, main house is small, and it says in-laws used by visiting family and friends and kids' birthdays and festivals. And then we also have, uh, and I remember you you on December 10th telling us about the, the space and how much you loved it. Uh, we have on also page 72 of the agenda, which looks back at our December 10th, 2019 miss, uh, meeting. Uh, you stated that uh, the space uh, is for your parents to stay whenever they come to visit from India and that this is where their children uh, play and where uh, we play as well too, end quote. Um, what is the ADU used for and what has it been used for since you purchased the property? So the purchase and the, from there and from December 10th to now, nothing has been changed. So we are still using it when my... Uh, if or when my uh, parents come, they stay there because our house is small. And uh, also this is additional place where my kids can go and play and uh, under our supervision. And also we have a prayer room over there where we pray and uh, that's all for now. Got it, perfect, thank you. And, and can I ask if uh, Cecil, whoever, whoever would need to uh, give me a, the ability to share my screen. Uh, can I? Can we do that? Let's see. You should have the ability to share your screen. Uh, this is this is Commissioner. Who's speaking? Uh, Colville. Colville. Let, let me just double check. And, and it says I can't share while somebody else is sharing. So I think we need the applicant oh. to unshare. Yeah. There you go. Now you should have sharing ability. There you go. Beautiful. Perfect. So uh, let's see here. Uh, desktop. Uh, let's see. Can you guys? Um, uh, now this is my first time sharing a screen, so I appreciate your uh, your patience here. Um, well, we're still in the public hearing uh, section of the meeting. Uh, and and this, is, this is okay. very important uh, okay. for, for me with, to ask them directly once we close it. Then, of course, we'll speak okay. together. But I, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to address them with something. So okay, um, gotcha, gotcha, good. I appreciate the patience, guys. Okay. Uh, let's see here. We are now sharing. Do you guys see this? Yes. This is where this is where, and this is directed to the applicants. This is where I have a hard time when I look at the the the, 
how genuine somebody is when they discuss their story and, and of course doing due diligence as a commission uh, what we do is we do our research and, and looking at the property here you can see as I scroll down uh, the price history on this uh, shows the property clearly being sold like you said for that price of 1.131 uh, and then we have within in immediate uh, three months we have the property being listed for rent now uh, of course a property 10,000 square feet this big with an ADU would not be rented for $2,200. That leads me to believe, of course, that it is just the ADU that is being rented, uh, not the full structure. We can see multiple listings, uh, new prices, listings removed, periods in time in which that could have been listed, uh, uh, rented for maybe a year or a certain uh, period of time, and then uh, the tenant would move out and then you would remodel it, uh, and of course, then uh, list it again. Now, we can see multiple here. Uh, so, of course, this isn't enough for me to, to make any definitive conclusion, but uh, if you do further digging, we can see the Trulia listing still has the actual listing with the description from the property owners that has a very intelligently marketed uh, listing for the actual ADU. And we can see everything here with full rent, the amenities provided on this. Now, to confirm, this is 309 Reading. This is what we are talking about. This unit here with pictures of the ADU. Uh, we can see everything regarding what comes with this uh, ADU being rented. And then, of course, what, what catches my eye, which I thought that was strange, was uh, item 15, uh, which is uh, touting a 2015 construction on this and a renovation in 2018. That would further confirm my suspicions that the property, the ADU itself, was rented out uh, to multiple tenants. And upon the, uh, one of them moving out, they did renovate it for another one to move in. And we could also see here that it says here that this is uh, on hold now we are processing applications and we'll go ahead and take the unit off for now so my question to you as the applicants having having given us the story this entire time that this is a very special family place for you to pray and spend time together how do you approach what i've just uh, brought up here is it a question for us yeah, this, this is the question. My, my question, uh, again, to clarify is, uh, what do you have to say for the, the fact that we have clear proof that this ADU has been at least attempted to be rented, if not definitively it was rented? Attempted to be rented? It was attempted to be rented. And every time I can show you the proof. And right now also you can come and visit anytime. And we have our parents. We have pictures with that. And we can chronologically show you the pictures from 2015 to 2020. Every year, my parents visited my in-laws and my father, and they have lived there. My kids are playing, and I have pictures of that. So if you have question about that, I have chronological picture of that time frame, which I can show you. And right now, in uh, we have the uh, opportunity with uh, uh, you know advanced technology and all, we can show you that when the picture has been taken, and though I don't think it's relevant, but still because you have questioned, so I can tell you that we have chronological picture that we have been staying there and it's not has been rented out. And yes, we have been attempted to rent it out twice. And we were, first of all, we were not, uh, our parents visited, so we were not uh, renting out. And second of all, uh, this case happened. So of course we haven't been rented it out. So this is a stupid thing on my part. I have done that multiple times just to kind of as, assume what's a rental market and if we have a scope of it, but we have never rented it out. You'll see that it's been listed multiple times. And I wanted to see what's the traction, what is the option of if we should spend the money to get it legalized and if we should spend the money on, on uh, legalizing this and you know, seeing what is the scope of it. But yes, uh, this, the issue with this is uh, since it's not a legal structure, we cannot legally rent it. And uh, the thing is that any renter can sue us and get much more than rent if we rent it out. So yes, I have listed it just to see the traction if we can make money out of that unit before we go into the uh, whole legalization process and spend money on that. But uh, this was just a listing that I have done. And it's been done multiple times just to see uh, what's the market like. And, and so when you say that we are processing some applications and we'll go ahead and take the unit off for now, you're, yeah, you're so telling that, us that... 
so yes, at that point we are telling that we are not taking any application. At that point, I've got some calls and it was becoming unbearable at one point to receive so many calls and I have a full-time job. So I kind of put that so that uh, this application is staying on hold. But yes, I, I do accept that I have done that multiple times just to see if I can at a later time, if I can put it on rent and make up the money that I will be spending it for legalization purposes. Thank you for clarifying, uh, I concede. Okay, now we're still in the public hearing and I think that we had other people that wanted to speak on this uh, item. So uh, if they're still with us. So does anybody, uh, anybody else wanna speak on this item? Let's see. Hey, uh, can you guys hear me? My name is Raja. The Raja, okay, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, uh, I'm a resident at, in Campbell, 1216 West Hacienda Avenue for the record. Uh, so I know this case has been going on for two years. I have actively worked with Daniel for the last two years on the Campbell ADU resolution, and I have seen this case coming up and going multiple times. So this is what uh, like the Campbell rules allow to be a garage to be built with zero setback in that neighborhood. And then someone can convert that into a garage uh, ADU, which would have been absolutely legal. But right now, this was built like 30 years ago or 40 years ago, and someone is stuck with it, right? So you just go and demolish it because, you know, A plus B equal to C, but, you know, something else is not, right? It, it's, it just doesn't make sense to make logic that, oh, if it was a garage, you could have converted, but because this was a non-conforming structure as an ADU, this is like that. And the other thing about permits, Campbell does not have any records of permits beyond like 95 or 90. I myself have personally issued, I have proofs to actually support that there are no archives of the permit, even with the permit application given. Whereas I have a paper permit with me, but city of Campbell doesn't even have a scan record on that. I have proofs to support that. And the other thing is, you know, it's, it's a long process. Like the intent of the law that the state is trying to push is to add, uh, you know, housing. Uh, if someone has an ADU, whether they use it for renting or to keep their family is up to their own personal thing. It's not the, the business of the city is to see the legality of things and stuff, right? Not to chase, oh, you have done that and this. So I just don't understand the logic of why city is forcing on, oh, we will allow this if it is for this use or at least the commissioners are even bringing up that perspective. It's just not ethical or even legal if I, if I have to say it. Uh, I understand the staff is doing what they are supposed to do. It's their duty to you know, implement the rules and stuff. But you guys are the commissioners. You are sitting in the commissioner chair. You have to face, right? You have to listen to the people. It's not the, the, the staff is not incentivized to listen to the people. They are getting their salary to implement the rules and they have a legal obligation to it. You guys are in the chair to listen to the people and do what is right here. And every city, almost every city is giving a variance or not variance, but like, you know, any old lady use can be legalized kind of a thing. But Campbell is not in that direction. I, I have seen that in the last meeting, I think Commissioner Bookbinder has uh, tried to put that on the agenda and it got voted out. I know you guys are trying for that too. It's a simple thing. All the neighbors are okay with it. Every citizen is coming and saying we are okay with it. Building is okay. Fire is okay. So I just don't understand the logic in you know what you guys are trying to extend this further. So just listen out to the people of the like you are the residents of Campbell. So I'll just listen to the neighbors. Neighbors are okay. Building code is okay. Fire is okay. You know, and I don't know how many of you folks have followed the ADU process with the city. I have numerous conversations with the uh, HCD people, Greg, right? Directly with the head of the ADU division at uh, the HCD department at the state. The state's intention is to provide housing, right? I don't know why the city is trying to go again as that, right? They're telling, okay, if, if it was an existing garage, it would have absolutely not been an issue. And, you know, Anyone can challenge the city saying, hey, you don't have records back from this time, even if it got converted from the county to the city, right? It's at the same way. The, right now, the planning department staff is challenging, give me proof. 
Someone can go and say the song, give me proof that you don't have it. Right? Thank, thank you, sir. Well, I have to ask you to wrap up here pretty quick. Yeah, so that's my thing. Like, it's like, oh, you versus me, yeah. because someone did not put, yes, it, Santa Clara County does not have records, you know, from back then. And no one is going to sign for things that when they were not working there and they don't have a record of it. Even city of Campbell, I have a document with me with the city issued permit in from 1990 the city does not have it in its archive. And it was a document given by city of Campbell. So how do you justify that, that the city does not have an archive of it and then we'll go and ask people to prove it? Well, no, thank you, sir. We appreciate, that's good, good input. We appreciate that. Um, now, is there anybody else who wants to speak on this item? Audrey, are you gonna speak on this item? I, I see it there, okay. Yep, you're, you're right, Tink, I just unmuted me. So, um, Audrey Key Driver, president of Stack Santa Moss Area Community Coalition, Neighborhood Association. Um, this property is not in our area. However, we feel it's highly relevant due to the fact that we have a number, I mean, a large number of um, garage conversion, conversions, ADUs. I know of even one that's a two-story building that was an ADU was added on top of a garage. Um, we have a lot of this type of situation we feel will be coming up in the future. And so we, we perceive this as somewhat of a landmark. I'd like to just briefly address a couple things. This particular part of Campbell was annexed into the city of Campbell around 1979, which is just a couple years past the date on the document that from the county showing that this building did exist. Um, the city of Campbell would allow this to be a legal structure had there been a permit and had it been an extension of a garage, which was then later converted to an ADU. And I don't believe there is anyone who can say that that is not exactly what occurred. And that due to the county record, the document showing that that was probably a permit issued and the work may have been performed a couple of years later due to the annexation process that that part of Campbell was going through. Um, I appreciate that um, uh, Mr. Kamoyan had Director Kamoyan aerial photographs um, not being shared with uh, uh, the Planning Commission at this time. Um, I think that uh, you need to really consider the documents you have before you um, as uh, Planning Commissioners right now. Um, not that I have any question regarding um, the, the truth of these, I'm just saying that um, uh, it makes a difference whether you can look at a timeline or not. Um, I, I, I just really believe that the intent of this home, homeowner, and I also agree with um, Raja that what you do with your property, whether you rent it or use it for personal use is not something that it is legal to rent your property and that um, the opportunity to do so is a big part of what the state wants is to provide um, more housing opportunities and uh, reasonably priced housing opportunities for, for um, people to have uh, uh, good housing. Um, lastly, the, the um, sorry, I'm trying to switch between documents from my computer and still have, I'm using three systems here trying to keep track of everything. Um, the requirements for a variance, um, Daniel, um, can you put this back up? You know, I do believe that this actually, I disagree with staff. I believe that this project meets several of these requirements. The uh, lot size is somewhat unique and therefore it met, meets the requirements of uh, an uh, uh, exception. Um, uh, depriving applicant. Yep, sorry, that was perfect where you were. <laughs> Great. Uh, privileges enjoyed by other owner, owners in the same zoning district. Their land, um, while it's, it's zoned, is smaller than what they would normally be allowed. Um, I think they do have exceptional or extraordinary circum circumstances. I don't think it's a special privilege. I think that it is under current state um, uh, intent and laws that it would be an acceptable um, uh, option to do. And I do believe that it would be a, a, 
impractical and unnecessary hardship, both physical, financial, and frankly, mental, to make these people chop off four feet of the, of the side of their accessory dwelling unit. Um, so I, I believe these um, are, should all be pretty much green check marks, not, not red. Um, I do think that- Your audio's going down and in and out, Audrey. Just okay, so you know. is, this, is this better? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, so um, finally, I'm a big law and order gal. You guys know that about me. If this is a new development coming in, and somebody said, well, I just want to build this, you know, two feet from the side fence. I'd be the first one saying, saying no, because there are other options. In this case, this was done 40 years ago and nobody has objected to it. And it is done to code. My big concern now, get it post permitted make them go through the process of having it inspected, make sure the wiring is done correctly, the plumbing, that the construction is safe and well done and, and allow them to um, proceed with making this a legal structure. I wish more people would make the attempt to legalize their currently not legal ADUs for the safety of the city. So thank you very much. Thank you very thank you. much. Uh, but do we have any others? I don't think we have any other speakers, do we, uh, for this item? Anybody else? Let me get the Q&A here. Nope. Okay. All right. Seeing uh, or hearing no other, uh, no <coughs> other speakers, then we'll, uh, we'll close the uh, public hearing is closed and we'll bring it back to the commission uh, for discussion. Uh, I'd like to ask a question of staff just to clarify my understanding of this to start. Is there a, a gap in our knowledge of what was permitted when, um, where it's possible that the garage was extended legally, but the records were lost and then it was converted to an ADU and there's just no record of it? I'm not saying like we have evidence that that's what happened, but is it given the spottiness of records even dating from the 90s and certainly earlier like do we know that that didn't happen no i mean that is always a possibility that records can get lost uh particularly i mean from properties that were annexed into the city from the county uh, they don't provide us copies of records when those properties are uh, taken in by the city i mean in the same way we don't have records for campbell village properties but again, I think, uh, I mean, Audrey hit a good point that it's the findings that are up on your screen. This is really the focus of your conversation. It's not at all the commission's purview to look at the legality of the structure. I mean, it is purely an administrative function. All right, thank you. Um, moving on sort of um, more broadly, I'm just gonna start with my thoughts on this. Sure. Um, so, um, just uh, saying that Commissioner Colville shared. Or just uh, uh, one moment, uh, Chair Cray, should I uh, stop screen sharing or do you want me to leave this? Uh, why don't you keep leave, leave that up. Okay, leave it up. Unless just, somebody uh, else wants to share something on it. FYI, I don't know what you're sharing because it just says Senior Planner FEMA has started screen sharing for me. Um, the variance findings page oh, of right. the report. Okay, that's uh, page 221. I hope well. You, you should be I'm able to sure. see it. It's probably just hidden, or you have to click one of the. Yeah, others. you might have to click on the uh, share content uh, button up there. Uh, it's just not showing for me. Um, the the thing I wanted to mention, um, I thought that Commissioner Colville brought up something interesting, which was um, like, why would we use discretionary powers to? Um, like, why would they feel, why would the applicant feel entitled to have this particular ADU? And the thing that I, that struck me was that they're, they're not, they don't specifically desire an ADU with a tiny weird setback, a tiny non-conforming setback. They desire an ADU. They would obviously move it if they could. They didn't put it there, but they're in the situation now. And it's, it's disappointing uh, that they did not mention having at any point rented it. Um, it I honestly would 
look more favorably on it if uh, people were living there and we were talking about getting rid of a, a home for people. Um, and there, there is a crisis on. Uh, I guess I, I can see the reasoning behind not give, not granting a variance in that um, the like it would be possible to put an ADU there in a conforming way, so we don't like there's a possible world in which we would not need to grant a variance. Um, I guess all I can rest on here is that this feels kind of Kafka-esque. Um, there's no meaningful moral hazard here. It's a, a non-conforming lot that's very unusual in our city. Um, it was constructed some decades ago. There, there's no opposition from the neighbors. There's like the bad outcome that we're talking about doesn't really appear to affect anybody. And it strikes me that much as like, they, they live on a non-conforming lot. We're not insisting that they move their property lines because that lot is non-conforming. Um, I, I don't see the justification for insisting that an unobjectionable housing unit be demolished for similar reasons. Hey, Daniel, if, if I could just inter, interject, I sent you a text message. I didn't get a response back. It's my understanding that receive a complaint on this, did we not? Correct. So this was a complaint that was received actually two years to the month. So I've heard that twice, one from Audrey, uh, and maybe we just didn't disclose it, and now from Commissioner Bookbinder. That um, just to be okay. clear, none of the neighbors, like nobody nearby objects to it. The complaint was made anonymously by somebody who does not live near there. It's confidential. <laughs> okay, so it would be odd if somebody had complained about it and then signed on in support of it. I, but yes, somebody somewhere in the city has has complained about it, and this is why I, I would be in favor of some kind of of amnesty program because this this does seem like it provides an opportunity for people to, I guess, harass other people if there's. Uh, some unknown number of in some way non-conforming ADUs out there were putting forth a really terrible set of incentives for people to uh, possibly harass each other, for people to definitely not try to legalize or ensure the safety of the ADUs that they have. Um, I don't have a particularly you know, wonderful solution for this, but the, this, this situation definitely seems to indicate broader problems with the with what we have. That's what I have. Anybody else want to jump in? Uh, yes, I uh, do. Can you hear me? Ahead. Oh, go ahead. So, um, yeah. So um, thanks, Commissioner Bookbinder. And um, thanks to everybody for providing all the really insightful um, details. Since this is um, definitely not a, uh, a clear cut case, we are going back in time, trying to um, figure out what happened, piecing together old documents and um, uh, old photos and things like that. So um, definitely not an easy situation. But since we're talking about the, the variance and um, as this being a possible mechanism for moving this forward and getting it um, approved legally, um, I do want to weigh in on what I think about these um, findings um, specifically, so I will um, go down the list. Um, so the first one being that is there a practical difficulty or unnecessary um, physical hardship? Um, I do think that the fact that this um, lot is um, so narrow and that it was constructed, um, you know, in stages with, um, with unknown records um, makes it uh, difficult, uh, practically difficult to, um, to uh, put it together here. So um, the next one being depriving the applicant of privileges enjoyed by other owners in the same zoning district. Uh, this 
kind of ties to the first one because, because it is such a narrow um, lot being about 54 um, feet, that's smaller um, than R16 or R110. And actually, if you go back to the documents provided when this was in the county, um, that was um, zoned as an R18, which would be, I forget if it's either 70 or 80, but anyway, back then it was um, certainly much smaller than the R18 um, zoning that it was originally designated as. Um, exceptional or extraordinary circumstances, I would say everything that we've been talking about in terms of um, lack of history, um, permits, um, I thought the, the public comment was pretty informative in terms of um, actually having an, an example of a permit that the city doesn't have records of. And um, there's definitely some missing pieces related to what we've been talking about from the county's um, standpoint. And then um, number four, will not constitute granting of a special privilege. I would say we should think about this one um, not in terms of this, you, this one individual situation um, and whether or not we grant the privilege to this property and not grant privileges to um, future non-conforming um, ADUs. But um, I would say uh, similar to what Commissioner Bookbinder said that we need to think about um, making um, exceptions for all of the non-conforming ADUs in the city so that they can be legal um, and safe. And from that standpoint, approving this variance does not constitute granting a special privilege in this case. Um, and then, um, of course, this obviously isn't detrimental to the public. So I think it's really important that we, um, A, hear what the, um, see that this is really unique and special, requires a variance, and then also look at it from a higher level in terms of what the state is trying to do to create housing, um, to create um, opportunities for people to live in the area and, and overall improve the quality of life for, um, for, for renters, um, for owners and create more housing stock. I'd like to just uh, add on to that, that I, I think this really is a city policy question. Like the reason why we're in such a, a pickle here is that the city has not really provided for this. So like there, there is really an open policy question of what should we do with the unpermitted ADUs? And de facto, what, what's fallen to us is uh, ad hoc enforcement based on uh, when somebody complains about it, which is for reasons I've, I've outlined before, I think is, is a really bad outcome. Who's next? Commissioner Colville, did you want to speak on this? Please, please. Um, I've got a few things to say. Um, you know, this one's, this one, I wouldn't say it's personal for me, but I work in the real estate industry. Um, and so I take special exception to these sorts of things here. Uh, to start off, when we look at the variance findings, I mean, uh, I, I have a hard time um, seeing it not being very black and white, especially when we talk about uh, constituting uh, the granting of a special privilege. If they were a identical lot uh, to theirs, uh, shape, size, everything, and that person went to apply for an ADU that was in the same exact position in the same size, this would not be granted. This would be denied. Therefore, uh, what we have here is a special privilege given to this one unit that gives them an advantage over others of the same size. This is a special privilege, in my opinion, black and white, and it's hard for me to not see it otherwise. Um, I think at the end of the day, what we have here is something that is unfortunate. And uh, every time we encounter something unfortunate, of course, we cannot just uh, buckle and, and, and give in to whatever it may be just so that we don't have to experience something uncomfortable. In this case, we already know in the Bay Area, there are plenty of uh, structures that are non-conforming and non-permitted. And of course, uh, if they were to try to get legalized, uh, a lot of them probably would not be able to. Why? Because they were illegally constructed in the first place, most likely because they couldn't get permits. Of course, it would be uh, permitted and legal work uh, had they done the right steps and they didn't probably for a very good reason. So when we look at this, I brought up some great information I felt was fantastic uh, for the discussion regarding um, their intent with the ADU, 
of course, people spoke about how it's not uh, in my purview to discuss that. But of course, uh, I look at the person in front of me who is who is giving me information and, and uh, selling me on, on this being a special part of their home. But then I also see multiple listings that are conveniently uh, taken down uh, periodically in what looks like uh, lease cycles and then renovated, clearly marketed as being renovated uh, at 2018 in that one uh, rental listing. We have no definitive proof whether or not it was listed, uh, I'm sorry, rented. I would find it hard to believe that that did not rent, uh, especially being that they posted this so many times and then renovated it as well too. Um, when we have a situation where somebody buys a house, they have a set of disclosures, just like I brought up to the applicant. Anytime you buy a house, you will get these disclosures. Your agent will tell you everything that's in that packet, including the non-conforming, non-permitting units. This is a massive decision. If you decide to move forward with purchasing this property, you are taking on a huge risk. This was relayed to them and they knew that there were risks involved. And unfortunately, there was a complaint that is uh, brought up uh, this situation to our attention, but uh, the information was relayed to them. I, I can't I can't allow the, them to, to continue to, to victimize themselves when they, they willingly bought a property. Um, and we can see here, the, the property uh, was purchased by the person who flipped it uh, and sold six months later. The, purchase, the purchaser purchased it for $650,000. This was in January of 2015. And they sold it to the applicants six months later, just a standard flip for 1.13. Now, this is almost half a million dollars more than the previous owners uh, had sold it for. So of course, what could constitute such a large increase in value this fast? It would be a major upgrade, i.e. an upgraded ADU. Uh, what else could constitute six months and half a million dollars in an increase in price? That's phenomenal. That's insane. Now, I see these developers all the time. I, I, I work hand in hand with them. I work in the, the industry. I, I, I see this. It is very common for them to, uh, in this case, take uh, vesting in an LLC, meaning their LLC owns the property. If the, if the company that owns the property it flips it and quickly moves on to the next one. That's exactly what we see here uh, taking place, which tells me, of course, it was a flip and the seller was probably trying to make an extra buck. This is, this is unfortunately not uncommon. So again, what we see many times is somebody will buy a property and put some work into it and then uh, hand off the problem, almost like hot potato to the next uh, person involved and the buyer is going to buy it. And then they assume that risk. Now, as planning staff has said many times, uh, there are civil matters, uh, legal lawsuits uh, that they could take up with the seller at a different point in time if they wanted to. I don't think that would pan out in their favor, unfortunately, but they have every right to pursue legal action to the seller if they felt like this was misrepresented. Every right to do that. Um, nothing's stopping them. But us as a city, uh, we can't be held liable for the transactions that are taking place and then they can't point the finger at us and say, it is our fault. Now, unfortunately, uh, they have said exactly that. They had said that. Uh, this is uh, our fault and it is the city's responsibility. Um, page 105 of the PDF says, uh, Campbell uh, is the one who is responsible, says that city of Campbell's responsibility for letting this property sell three times and not enforcing any code until now. This further plays into the victim mentality, which for me is frustrating because we need to be accountable for our actions. We need to be responsible. And at the end of the day, we had a transaction where you had a, a seller who was shady and, and they maybe did something that they shouldn't have done and then the buyer bought it, uh, and now the buyer got caught uh, holding the hot potato, and, and they need to step up to the plate in this case and say, you know what, yes, uh, this happened, and now I need to uh, conform and do my best to do this. They're doing their due diligence. We're giving them a lot of time here. I hope they feel like we've been fair. Uh, so that's, that's, of course, very important. But uh, the, the point being, what they have here is a uh, non-conforming, non-permitted, income-producing ADU unit. This is a huge advantage over any other property owner that would like to build under the same circumstances. This is unfair um, across the board uh, for them to be able to, to, to do this the way that they have done it. It's unfortunate, uh, and I hate to sound like uh, it might be cold uh, and lacking affection, but at the end of the day, staff has done such a great job uh, giving us all the information and giving the applicants as much time as possible. Our job is not to think of hypothetical situations that would allow this to somehow be at one point permitted for a very small period of time in which that would have been legal. And therefore now we have uh, a structure that's conforming and, and legal and we could fit it into this one little piece. Uh, our planning staff have done a great job of doing their, their best to give us the information. And what we do have here again is that uh, that income producing ADU unit for somebody um, that nobody else can have, giving them a special privilege. 
uh, I can see it at this point. Thank you, Commissioner Colville. Who, who, who's next? Who wants to jump in? Let me try and uh, jump in here. I have my hand up. Well, I didn't see any hands. I got, I got the screen. <laughs> All right. Whoops. Hold on. Uh, uh, to me, we've got a family that's been in here. Uh, I don't know how many years. Um, they're just trying to get a uh, comfortable house. They're just trying to move on. Uh, I don't want to question what they're uh, at all, what they're uh, planning to do with the house, either now have done before. Um, what we're what we're simply trying to figure out here is: do we provide a variance? We're not we're not making a decision across the whole city. Uh, staff, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but uh, in providing a, a a variance for this property. Uh, that that we really don't give a precedence. We, it's not a precedence that we're setting. Now, it's, we have to uh, take it to uh, a higher level as a uh, Commissioner Bookbinder has and Commissioner Ostrowski have brought up. Uh, but uh, right now, we're we're just looking at the decision of this family, trying to make sure that their home is usable and workable. And the staff, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we provide a variance, it's also uh, transferable to a subsequent owner? That's a question to staff. Is that correct? Well, a variance belongs with the property. So as soon as they were able to obtain a building permit following a variance approval, that would settle the issue uh, forever. So um, I, what, I'm, what I'm seeing here is that we're making a decision on a single property. Uh, and what we are, what we're looking at in these variance findings, uh, just to um, reiterate what the Commissioner Ostrowski said on the first one, practical difficulty. Uh, it's, it's impractical to move a property four feet. Uh, and uh, the costs associated with that are, are, are uh, not going to uh, benefit and give the... Uh, uh, so, uh, so I think there is a, an unnecessary physical hardship associated with it. Um, the applicant privileges, that they've got an ADU and they'd like to use the ADU. And I think uh, they want to be able to uh, use an ADU and many others in the zoning district use that. Um, the uh, exceptional and extraordinary circumstances, that was, that's what we've been talking about for, I don't know, three hours here, three hours last time. And the, the property owner has been working on that for, uh, you know, it sounds like two years or so. Uh, and we're, we're not going to, it's not going to be a special privilege. It's a one-off four feet uh, that we're giving a, a variance on. So I'm, I'm also not sure that we're going to, change anybody else's mind on the commission. Uh, I'd like to suggest that uh, uh, somebody wants to propose a uh, motion and uh, we, you know, we see what we see what we got. Okay, Commissioner, I think we have a few more want to chime in here. Anybody else want to uh, comment? I'm happy to- yeah, Sure, if I can, Chair Craig. Yeah, sure, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, wasn't, I wasn't in it the last one. I can see why it was um, right. uh, difficult. <laughs> Um, but, you know, it's been a long discussion, a lot of people put a lot of thought and effort into this. Um, you know, but trying to get to, you know, as Daniel said, a purview of what we're trying to do and related to the variance findings, you know, the, the variance findings are somewhat subjective. Um, and while I see where the staff have come from, right, I could also argue um, against that, probably along the lines of Commissioner Ostrowski and actually I think Audrey um, put it quite succinctly as well. And although you could argue on both sides, I type of tend to come down and say, well, actually I can see that the variance findings do justify um, a variance. Um, so I think that's, yeah, maybe a, a longer conversation, but the, the summary of my, where, I'm, where I'm thinking about it um, and I can't help in the back of my mind, you know, whether they rent it or not, whether they purposely or non-purposely didn't disclose that. Um, okay, may have some bearing on the character, but actually whether they rent it or not is not, is, is down to them, right? And in fact, we probably want these things rented or used. Um, but, you know, to get it effectively demolished or substantially changed, on a building that is uh, that is fit does seem to be um, maybe out of proportion to any potential, um, if, if crime is the right word, right? Um, or infringement um, of, of uh, the, the zoning and, and the setback. Um, so I'm, I, I, I think I'd be 
for granting this variance and against this motion. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Ching. Commissioner Rivlin, did you wanna chime in or? Yeah, I've, I've been thinking about the meeting in December and this meeting and rereading, it's on my screen here, the variance findings from Daniel's share, screen share. Uh, I guess that, you know, is I've heard my fellow commissioners share those. Uh, so first, you know, I, I, I appreciate the applicants uh, due diligence here. I, I understand their engineering mindset and thought process and work through all of the facts that are available to them, sometimes going to much more detail than even the city is prepared to prepare because they're defending, you know, their own livelihood or in this case, their own property. And, you know, I could see a situation where this could affect any number of us uh, given the circumstances. I, I, I don't think it's, it's definitely not on the city to help them add value to their you know, property when they perhaps made decisions uh, kind of knee jerk as they followed that path. But I don't think that's under discussion here. I, I do wanna highlight the five variances, um, you know, the practical difficulty. Um, I, I could start to see some practical difficulties here uh, with moving the building. However, I think it's been proposed multiple times that they could, build an interior wall without having to move the building or tear down the building, it would ask, require they relocate their kitchen, uh, depriving the applicant of privileges enjoyed by other owners. Um, I don't think any other owner can um, have a building on a property line yeah. and get this. However, you know, if it had been permitted in, in the past, perhaps, so, you know, I could begin to understand where there's a deprivation if um, the, it's really a shame that we can't get those letters from the county. I, that, that would have obviously closed this all out and made this meeting moot, but that really is strange to me. The um, exceptional or extraordinary circumstances, um, not, I guess, I'm not sure, someone will have to convince me or make me understand what's exceptional. And then um, special privilege, um, you know, have we ever done this before? So a question to staff, two questions, and then I'll kind of mold this over a little bit more. Um, staff, we have to see and meet four of these of the five. Is that is that the benchmark? All, all the needs have to be satisfied. All five, okay. And then um, what could could you define special privilege? Well, I guess the idea of special privilege is that this one particular homeowner, homeowners is being given something that people in comparable situations are not being given as well. So, um, for example, just hypothetically, you know, another home with a building on a lot line um, that had not been permitted would not be given a variance either because that's a special privilege. That's not allowable by code. Well, to the extent that if you were to build a new ADU, you would not be able to gain a variance to simply build it on a property line. And that goes back to your conversation. To what extent should that fact have some bearing here? Because in that regard, they are arguably getting a privilege that other people would not otherwise be able to get because of their unique situation. And again, with these findings, the way that they're structured is really to focus on something that's topographical, geographical, that's outside of the homeowner's control. I mean, there's something typically wrong with the land. You have some sort of creek going through it, or it's particularly substandard in size. I mean, or maybe the commission finds that the five feet substandard width is sufficient, but it's good to focus on things that are outside of the control of the homeowner as being factors that should be weighed against factors that they do have control over. And placement of a building is something that is within the control of a homeowner. Just not this particular homeowner, it was of some previous homeowner. Yeah, that, that I mean, that is kind of a, a wild card in my mind where that, falls more into the line of extraordinary circumstance. But, you know, to the facts that Commissioner Colville has brought forward is, they, I see the applicant's initials 
buying off on the garage being too close to the property line. So the, the, the applicant and owner here, you know, whether or not they're flipping through 100 pages quickly, which I can contest, you know, I've seen in, in home purchases, but, you know, that is there for their review and they accepted it. So it is really tricky. And in the past um, meeting, I, you know, did not see that we met the, the bar for all five variances. Um, I'll continue to consider this and hear what my other commissioners have. It's, it's a, a definitely a, a hard decision to come to. To confirm. Thank you, to, Thank to, you Commissioner. To... Let me give my two cents real quick, uh, Commissioner Colville, just uh, yes, sir. Or we've all weighed in. I'll be, yes, I'll be pretty quick. And I have really a great conversation, great comments from everybody. I think the applicants did a great job and I think the city staff did a great job, especially especially good report on this one. Uh, and I, you know, I voted uh, against the variance in December and I'm still leaning that way to cut to the chase, but I'll try not to uh, repeat anything. And I'll, but I'll tell you why, since we open a lot of time, I'll tell you what, where, I'm, where I'm leaning at. Uh, and I can certainly see when you look at the various findings and I can, I, I think there is, despite Daniel's comments there, I think there is some subject, subjectivity there. And I think how, you know, Commissioner Ostrowski and Commissioner Ching and Audrey, how they read them, you know, the other way, I think you can go that way. I kind of agree with the way the staff went on, the way they read these. Uh, and, I, you know, really, I, I guess what I come down to on all of these you know, variances, you want to be flexible, you know, the state wants ADUs, we want ADUs. Uh, I think the only item, really the only major item that came up in this discussion that, that gave me pause, it gives me pause, is the whole thought of, well, maybe we want to grant a variance for every single non-conforming ADU. And I have never thought that. I thought we spent a lot of time on our ADU ordinance and I thought it was a pretty, you know, uh, it gave a lot of, uh, it was pretty lenient. I think it gave a lot of uh, openings for ADUs. Uh, so then I come down to this one and I, I guess I'll look at, I'll, I'll just read this one passage from the staff report. It's kind of maybe the thing that, that, that is the thing that's weighing most on me. Should such a variance be granted, numerous other individuals could claim disparate treatment, disparate treatment for being forced to comply with the applicable setback requirement. Additionally, a moral hazard is created by treating those who ask for forgiveness rather than permission with preferential treatment. I think those are good or good and, 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 and accurate statements. I, and, and, you know, not, not just this particular type of, of variance, but you know, there'll, there'll be, an, there'll probably be a whole parcel of types of variances that'll come our way. And I, and I think maybe Commissioner Bookbinder's right. If we had a, if we just had a city policy on this stuff that can get rid of a lot of these questions, maybe that's the way to go. Maybe the bigger question is, yeah, let's let every single non-conforming ADU be, be illegal. That's another way to go. Uh, I hadn't thought about that until this conversation. But uh, for the reasons that I say that that's why I'm, you know, I'm still leading uh, and I, I hate, I really empathize with the homeowners, but I really am uh, leaning still uh, to vote in favor of denying the variance. So Commissioner Colville, I know you wanted to speak. Uh, oh, thank you, sir. Um, and I agree, everything has been fantastic in terms of our opinions, our conversation. Uh, just because one of us might look at something more black and white doesn't mean it is black and white. So uh, the question I have for staff, now the variance findings these have already been concluded by staff. Our job right now is not to try to find these variances. Is that correct? Well, if the majority of the commission wishes to approve the variance, the public hearing would need to be continued so that we could draft a resolution for approval that could support a affirmative determination of these findings. I mean, I think from your conversation, there's enough for us to be able to uh, draft something, but, um, you don't need to, at this point, go through each one, itemize the reasoning, unless you want to. But I think we have enough from the conversation thus far. Got it. And I just wanted to confirm that, that you guys had already, of course, done the work on the back end to, to and, and of course, uh, I'd like to, to, to make this very clear. I, I, uh, people have been coming out and speaking out as if uh, Campbell, uh, I don't want to say is uh, anti-ADU, uh, or hard to deal with or rough or slow or whatever it might be. I mean, we have staff who's working very, very hard 
uh, and doing their best to, to help the applicant. And unfortunately, the information is and the data hasn't been there to, to support the applicant's request. And, and I think that's the biggest problem is, is we're having a hard time or some of us are having a hard time accepting the fact that uh, there could be an outcome that is, again, unfortunate or uneasy uh, in this case. And, and you know, setting the precedence. Uh, of course, our job is to take everything on a one by one basis. So uh, if we uh, approve this one and then uh, the fear is that everyone's going to start coming in and trying to apply for the non-conforming stuff, we'd have to look at all of them. Uh, but of course, we are setting a precedent by saying, yes, what happened is okay or no. Now, think about this hypothetical situation. You have a seller who uh, did illegal upgrades and modification to a home, sold it to a buyer. Uh, and now if we grant this variance, everybody uh, involved in this is now uh, pretty much uh, scot-free, uh, no penalties, no harm done, uh, and there's no ramifications for the actions upon either party. So then you have people who are going to start thinking, great, well, let me go ahead and buy this house as a developer. I'm going to flip it. I'm going to do a whole bunch of illegal stuff to it. Who cares? Uh, I'm going to sell it uh, to a buddy of mine. He's going to buy it. I'm going to have everything disclosed. doesn't matter. Uh, then we'll just approve, apply for a variance and say that it's an ADU and we're trying to uh, conform to California ADU law. I mean, you do have a, a door that opens up just slightly when you start to say, uh, yes, uh, this is okay. And the fact of the matter is uh, you have a very large income producing or, or potentially income producing structure. It's uh, in a place it shouldn't be on, on that lot. And that's, that's very difficult for us to say yes to um, because we are pro ADU and we want ADUs. I would love for them to have an ADU uh, in the right place. This is so, not an anti-U situation. I completely agree that we definitely don't want people to, you know, take advantage to buy a property, to do something illegal, and then try to ask for it to be um, approved and made legal. But I think that in this case, it's actually quite different than that because this is something that happened you know, 40, 50 years ago, and we have really incomplete information. And so um, the, the example you provided would be different because we would have, you know, very detailed aerial information. Um, we would have, I mean, you know, when a house gets remodeled, now you've got Google photos every three months, you can actually track the process completely. So there wouldn't be this kind of ambiguity that we're facing with this particular situation. And I would say that even if, you know, if we approve this and there are other um, old um, ADUs that have been there, you know, for decades and people do want to come forward, um, that's actually come forward and get them legalized, which means they have to be all brought up to code so that they're safe um, and uh, healthy for the people that, that want to live there. Those people being the renters who are the people that the state is desperately trying to find more housing for. So in my view, you know, there's nothing negative that's going to come up out of the fact that more people may come forward. The, the you know, we're talking about, we're, 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 we're here for the residents of Campbell. And if the residents of Campbell suddenly come forward and they want to legalize their um, non-conforming ADUs, then we should be looking at how do we make that happen in a more general sense rather than one, one by one. And the fact that more people would come forward as a result of this decision would be the people speaking. And, and that's the action that we should be responding to. Yeah, and these are fantastic points, Commissioner. Um, and we have a great plethora of opinion here. Um, I, I struggle when I see uh, the applicant within three months of buying the property and listing it for rent. Uh, I, I struggle when I see them listing it multiple times, uh, stating on the website that they've upgraded it, they've added new features, that they're making it even better. Uh, they're increasing the rent as time goes on, meaning pretty much in my eyes, uh, they've rented it out, leases up, and now they're going to have another lease. These things are, are it looks right like in front of it, it was twice, right? They put it up there twice. And, you know, uh, uh, I, I've uh, personally uh, done that exact uh, same thing myself, you know, when I was trying to figure out if I was going to make a decision about, you know, staying here or selling or renting and doing something different, right? And I also have an engineering background, so I can totally relate to the applicant. And, you know, as an engineer, we like to explore all of the options that exist. 
and well, I can see how putting it up for rent, um, I completely believe what he said. He was trying to understand, you know, what is market rent? Like what is the real time market information? And the only way to get that on your own property is to put it up and see what kind of interest you get at the price point that you're listing it for. And that's, to me, that's just market research. That's what any person who wants more information about their property would do. Right, right. And, and, and we also see, though, in the same discussion that we have them saying we are processing applications, we'll take the unit off for now. I mean, these are clear indications that they're renting and making money off the property. Yet this entire conversation we've had with them over the months, they have brought up numerous times, despite staff saying that it is not in our purview and irrelevant, uh, that there are uh, financial issues with this, this situation. And, and staff, uh, they've been doing so good. And, and I'm, I'm sure they're, they're quite uh, frustrated with, with the fact that we can't look at the financial situation uh, and the burden that it, it's going to cost for them to move this ADU as, as part of our discussion point. This is not in our purview. Um, yet they have brought it up, the applicant, many, many, many times they brought up this, this, this financial issue. Um, yet then on the back end, we have something that's listed for rent and it says $2,000. If they were rented it for $2,000 a month, that's 24 grand a year. And I've owned the, the property for yeah, five years. It, it's really not this, our job to, to yeah. take into account the use of the property. It's whether or not we're approving that they are, it's going to be legal or it's not going to be legal based on the variance. It's not our job to question, you know, like their, their mentality and I agree on. I agree with you Ms. Uh, Commissioner Ostrowski I think that uh, we need to leave the property managed by the property owner and, and, and uh, I think and, we're making I think what we need to decide here and and uh, you know maybe I'll try again on uh, bringing it to a motion because I don't think you know, I kind of don't think anybody's mind is going to get changed. I, I think uh, it's time for a motion. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Can I add one more thing just to yeah. clarify my own position yeah. briefly? Um, thank you, everybody, for really like, like nobody can possibly say that we have not been thorough here. <laughs> this is a my my understanding. Of this this is a a terrible situation, and I am disappointed that we're here. And I will be bringing up, you know we should talk about making a citywide policy um, that for me, I am yep. really stuck between the ideal of, I want to ensure predictable, impartial treatment for everybody who comes here. And on the other hand, what seems like a very clear ethical imperative, this is a terrible situation. I wanted to say that's where I'm coming from. Please proceed. I'd like to propose a motion that we, uh... Uh, except the variance. Uh, I'll second. We can't, we can't I, do I that. I think you got to bring it back. Uh, you got to bring it back. I think, uh, Commissioner Hines, if we're correct. So a motion to approve would need to be a motion to continue the public hearing. Uh, we can do that to uh, July fourteenth, if that's fine with the director. We have an extra Tuesday this month. We have an extra week. So is. And then we will return to that meeting with a uh, draft resolution for approval. So do we put that to a vote? Do we need to vote on it? Well, that's your motion. And then we'll have yeah. to get a second. Yeah, we'll need a second. Correct. Second. I'll second. I think that's seconded by Commissioner Ostrowski. So uh, can we have a uh, roll call vote, uh, Kareem? Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Bookbinder? Aye. Commissioner King? Aye. Colville. Can I have clarification on what we're voting for? This is to further the conversation. Uh, to, with... to, to approve the variance at our next meeting. I see. Uh, no. Commissioner Himes. Aye. Commissioner Rivlin. You're on mute. Oops, we missed them. You're on Sorry, I, I had I had voted I and I had commented that I have a, a follow up comment after the vote is complete. Your vote is I. Yes, I. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Ostrowski. I. And Chair Cray. No. Five two. Okay, five two. So that item uh, approved, and it comes back to our at our next meeting of July fourteenth. And Commissioner Rivlin wanted to speak. Chair Cray, I, 
as we continue the item on the 14th, I would like to see the aerial evidence that the director was speaking of. Okay, I think that's good to ask. And this item is done until our uh, July 14th meeting. Uh, Community Development Director Kamoyan, do you have a report? Um, the only the only point is at the very end of that report, we just wanted to let you know that uh, we're going to uh, restart our scheduled meetings, and they're all going to be by Zoom until further notice. So just rely on the schedule and count on the fact that we'll continue to coordinate the Zoom meetings. That's it. Okay. Thanks, Paul. And I think uh, any other items, I think Commissioner Bookbinder wanted to speak on something. Yes, I had uh, two things I'd like to propose for agendizing for future discussion. But before that, I have a question. Um, Paul, um, do you have an estimate for about roughly when we'll be talking about parking? Yeah, we're gonna, we need to bring that back to you to formally initiate uh, a zone tax amendment to relax parking. Um, I think that's at your second July meeting. Yeah, July 20th. Oh. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I'd like to propose to agendize um, discussion about, I don't know if amnesties is the correct word, but about um, changing the zoning enforcement for currently unpermitted ADUs. Now, I don't know what specifically we want to do for that, but I think we should have a, I think it would be a study session and propose something to amend the zoning code to, so that we're not in this position again. Is that, is that clear enough that to, um, I'd like to agendize discussion of uh, establishing a specific kind of amnesty for um, existing, for legalizing existing ADUs. Yeah, and I think that's a great idea because when we did work on the, the ADU ordinance, this is one of the areas we didn't talk about. So, you know, we wanted to move that forward. Um, we had a lot of public support for moving that forward and we knew that we would be, you know, making changes and updates to it because we couldn't spend the time to to think about, you know, including, we couldn't spend the time to include many of these corner cases that we're talking about here. I second the motion to agendize that from Bookbinder. Uh, Corinne, do we need a, a vote on that? Oh, we, would, we would need a vote. Roll call or voice vote? It could be a voice vote. That would be you, Chair Cray. Oh, okay. So uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All, anybody Aye. opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, I guess that's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, there's one other thing I wanted to bring up, um, which is a little broader. Um, I would like to propose a study session on the history of segregation in Campbell's planning. Um, I have contacted the library, uh, which they didn't have information much. Their microfilm was currently being scanned. I talked to the museum. Uh, they have an intern working on that piece of history. Um, specifically, I'm, I'm asking this because a lot of localities, including here in the Bay Area, previously used racial covenants, HOAs which enforced racial exclusion, eventually mob violence to enforce segregation. Um, I realize that this is sort of a broader issue to discuss. I think with the general plan update coming up and especially what we talked about two weeks ago with there's a lot of, I guess, broad interest in these issues. Um, I understand that this may be like the city council may have to approve staff time to look into this. Um, I think this is worth spending time and resources in. We've inherited the city's basic shape from our predecessors. We should know what they did and why. Well, I ju I'll just uh, make a quick comment on that, uh, Commissioner Bookbinder, and, and you kind of and you mentioned it too. Uh, so you know, when we're working on the planning commission, these items are coming up, and we're seeing that there's a need for a hey, commercial parking. ADUs, we got to hit on something on that. And then we have our own items that come up like this one too with the, the, the historic covenants that were very unfair, of course. 
So I guess my only question is, so there, there's, so we got the city of Campbell, then there's a staff, there's a staff that has only so much time mm. and there's the city council that's kind of supposed to be kind of prioritizing the use of the time. So I'm not sure how or where or when the planning, how do we step, do we, maybe we can have, uh, you know, suggest it to the city council. Hey, this is a couple of things that we're seeing that we'd like, that we think should have a priority. Uh, I guess I just, I just don't know how the city council will feel. And I don't, and who, you know, we can also say who cares how they feel about it, but I don't know how the city council would feel about, you know, limited staff time and resources. So they're doing, they're, you know, those five people all have their things. Now, if the seven of us start having our things. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree yeah. with Chick, right? I, I, I don't know. No, I mean, I, 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 we see, you know, it's got a lot of validity to what Commissioner Bookbind is saying, but I think we've got enough stuff and there's only so much resource. And I think I feel probably is outside the purview of the Planning Commission. Um, so I, I, I don't know, given if you had unlimited time, right, or this, the, the City Council came back and raised this as a priority. I think it's more for the city council than than us, and we can end up agendaizing a whole bunch of stuff, and we miss out some of the things that we should be doing as a commission. I understand that. I my understanding is that, like this is how we raise things to the city yeah. council. No, 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 um, nice. But there does have to be a way for them to sort of push back and say, this is like. I, I think it's very, very clearly within our purview that we run into issues, and we have the experience and expertise dealing with this more regularly that we raise those issues. Um, I realize this is a uh, much broader, um, I guess. Well, to, you know, to me, that speaks to our need of, of, a, of a joint meeting at least once a year between the planning commission and the city council. This is where we can hit on these things. And we, and we, we see things that, man, this would be great for the city to take up. And we want to, we want to give our two cents and give our uh, input. So that, that's why I think that's, that's really a good idea and something we should, we should have been doing all along. I don't know why we haven't been. What's the status of our, like, are we planning on doing that? Is that, I realize that's something that's been mentioned. Or is that something we need to set up? Because I, I would absolutely be happy to bring this up in that kind of situation. I think the ball was rolling and then the, the COVID hit. And everything kind of fell. Did you bring that up to the city council commissioner, uh, planning director, Kermoyan, about well, a joint meeting? The, the the, uh, there's a hierarchy, as you know, in organizational structures. So what I do is when I hear um, your desire to hold a joint meeting, I raise that with the city manager. And okay. then the manager, who is the technical secretary to the council, will then check in. And it's really their call in terms of if they want to put that on the agenda. The planning commission, you not control the council's agenda. They, they do. So... Yeah, I could only pass your desire okay. and, and you. where it falls, it falls. Okay. Uh, Commissioner okay. Bookbinder, I uh, totally agree with you on, uh, on needing to have that item uh, as, a, as an agenda, as a, uh, you know, a, being able to talk it through uh, would be very good uh, and, and uh, very engaging and, uh, and frankly, very interesting uh, to uh, learn and unlearn. Uh, our uh, decisions that we've made in in the city, uh, you know. But I I also need you know not wanting to load up the uh, the city council or the or the staff in particular, you know, being able to look at the small business uh, uh, issues that are happening in the uh, in the city, in particular uh, the COVID nineteen impact. Uh, I think that that's a uh, uh, that's a key aspect that we need to be able to do uh, uh, from a you know, from a city standpoint to be able to pursue how to improve that situation that's that's hit us and it's gonna be with us for a long time. I'm wondering, uh, Commissioner Bookbinder, if, if we, you should check in with uh, our museum folks and, and talk with them. Oh, I have, there's currently an intern doing research on that and I asked them to get back to me as soon as they find something out. Okay, yeah. Um, so I, I absolutely understand the concerns raised here, and I would be very happy to to um, talk about this at a joint meeting um, if that's actually going to happen. Um, is is this a you know 
maybe next year kind of thing? Or is this like, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to put this in the proper place. I'm a little bit more leery of waiting until, for example, after the general plan is updated. You know, one of the topics that kind of coincides with that is the, um, you know, the, the uh, changes to public safety, because uh, that um, uh, based on uh, your, you know, uh, our, our, you know, how we've, how we've grown up and how the public safety is reacting to this situation, you know, maybe merging those two together, uh, you'll, uh, you'll, um, I think you might get more traction uh, when you, uh, you know, look at the combination of those two and, the, and public safety from the standpoint of how can public safety change uh, in light of the uh, events that we've seen most recently. I see that as being, I think that's a really important issue. I do see that as being further outside of our, our purview than uh, specific the specific history of segregation. I'm, I'm okay with uh, leaving this for now. I'd like to, um, I, I will follow up with uh, the city manager, um, trying to get an idea about how likely it is to get a joint session. And if it seems like we're kind of on our own, I'll see if I can feel out how um, council feels about staff spending time and effort on this. Uh, so I, I, will, I will come back to this. Good, well, good thought, Commissioner Bookbinder. Very good thought. Uh, anybody else? Anything else? Well, I guess then that the uh, Campbell Planning Commission meeting is adjourned till our next meeting of July 14th. See you, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank bye, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.